The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Saturdays or Sundays, SOR Media, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of this broadcast or podcast without the expressed written consent of SOR Media is strictly prohibited. Listener discretion is advised. Are you experienced? Then come own the night with us. Taking control, shoveling dirt in every hole. Predators to condemn your soul. Watching you and watching me. We're all Station atop the mountains of British Columbia. Live from SOR headquarters. This is Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. We live behind glass curtains and act like. Nothing's wrong Soon you will be long You can follow us on our website spacedoutradio.com and on Spaced Out Radio on iTunes You can follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Dave Scott S-O-R on Facebook at Spaced Out Radio Show and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio. Brother wants to make headlines, be immortalized. Everyone's got an electric eye with the digital spies. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride on Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. I know you're out there. It's Monday, April 30th, Tuesday, May 1st, if you're on the East Coast or across the pond. And this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I hope you had a great weekend as well as a great week and night. I am your host, Dave Scott, live from the Great White North in the Caribou region, on top of the mountains of central British Columbia, right here at SOR headquarters. We are 150,000 strong nightly on WQEE 99 Rock, the key in noon in Georgia. The United Public Radio Network, 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. We're at spacedoutradio.com. Spreaker, we're also live on the Fringe FM. You can check us out on Periscope.tv where we are live right now. Hi everyone in Periscope, great to see you. And if you want our archives, you can have them for free. We're not picky. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me a favor, hit that little subscribe button. I'd really appreciate that. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you there. You can rock out to some bubble foot. Shop at our Spaced Out Radio store, read the encounter online, my blog is on there as well, or watch great videos from UFO Seekers, Contact TV, and so much more. We're kicking off a brand new week here. It's going to be a lot of fun. The studio is about to start being built here soon. We got things going. We got things under control. It's going to be a new life here for Space Out Radio very, very quick, and I'm glad you're along for the ride. We really do appreciate you taking the time with us. Well, you know what? It's the final 
Monday of the month, which means the Butch, Butch, Butch is back, as in Butch Witkowski from UF4 Cop out of Pennsylvania. He is back for his monthly segment. We like to call strange days around these parts. Butch is a decades-long researcher into the strange and paranormal. A former police officer, Butch takes the cases of people dealing with the unknown very seriously as he and his team seek out the answers that always seem to be elusive. After all this research, is Butch even f- close to finding out what's going on? Probably not a hope, but the striking similarities of many of the stories are what keeps Butch going back and thinking that he could be closer than what he thinks. Butch Witkowski, my friend, my idol, the one I bow to every final Monday of the month. How are you, my friend? Uh, I'm good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure, as always. Good to have you back. What have you been up to? Uh, what have I been up to? Uh, moving into the new house, setting up my library, offices, uh, lab, uh, a couple trips to the hospital uh, for some acute bronchitis, which I'm just probably just getting over now. Uh, so that's pretty much been about it. You've been pretty busy. Are, are you doing okay health-wise? Because, I mean, that is a concern, my friend. Well, yeah, it was... Uh, it, it, the doctor said that um, <clears throat> when people move, especially if they've lived in a place for a long time, which we have here at this place, we've been here 21 years, and now we bought this new house. And uh, so he says, you're, you know, you're digging around in stuff that has been moved for eons. You got some mold spores probably and dust and all this stuff. And he said, you know, it just gets into your lungs. And he said, you're just a great candidate for uh, bronchitis. And um, it hit me about two and a half weeks ago, and I mean, it put me down. It took me down. I, I, I could barely breathe, um, all kind of. I took. I take enough drugs that I should be a member of the cartel. Um, it, but, you know, everything's worked out real fine. It's getting better. Um, sometimes I lose my voice, but they said that's to be expected. But hopefully we won't have that happen tonight. I had something funny happen earlier today. I got absolutely lambasted on Facebook and blocked by a lady because, you know, all these dog violence videos that are going on on Facebook, they're all over the place. Anyways, I've kind of taken a stance and I'm blocking people, kicking them off my friends list for posting these videos. Well, she went up one side of me and down the other tonight saying that I'm a coward, that I'm no good, that I am part of the problem because I don't want these these grotesque videos on my Facebook. I don't want to see them. We just lost Butch on the phone. We're going to call him right back. We're going to call him right back. Hopefully we're not having too many problems today. Well, his phone number's busy. I'm sure he's trying to call back. Yeah, so anyways... This lady goes absolutely haywire on me. Haywire. And she's sitting there, you know, ripping me a new one because I don't want to see these videos. I don't want to see these videos. It was absolutely grotesque. So I had to insult her. Hey, Butch, we lost you there for a second. Yeah, I think you lost me. Yeah. But, But, yeah, I've seen a couple of those videos, and I don't, I don't, I don't like them at all. I'm, you know, I'm an animal lover. Uh, I've got, always had pooches here at the house. We've got a couple dogs. Always had dachshunds or Great Danes or Dobermans. And, um, you know, I, 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 I really have a thing for animals. And, you know, Me too. Uh, I see these things where, you know, somebody's beating a dog with a hammer or, you know, throwing a cat in the river. I, you know, all I want to do is try to find out their address just to pay them a little visit, you know, along, like around Christmas time, New Year's. I'm sure I could find a couple people to help me hide the body. The worst part about it, there, there's people out there supporting this crap. Like, I had this guy mention today, because I posted on my Facebook with her comment. Her name is Sandy. She goes, Dave Scott, how dumb can you get? The petitions to county commissioners, local authorities, etc. do good. I know from personal experience. You just want to be ignorant. I can't stand ignorance. You are weak. Sad. And then she blocked me. So I posted that, and I laughed at it because I think it's kind of funny, you know, that someone that idiotic would would say that these 
these grotesque videos are happening. So this one guy, I'm not going to mention his name, comes, can we keep in mind that we share the same goal and not attack each other over the difference of opinion on how to achieve them, thus derail the actual movement to achieve that goal? I don't like to see them either, but I respect the fact that they are doing what they feel will make the difference, even if I dislike their methods. No! You're promoting violence because the one person who sees that says, oh, I can do better. Butch, there's always sure. that one guy who says, I, got, I can do better. You know, I look at it this way. If somebody could do that to a helpless animal, because let's face it, they all are helpless. I don't care what they are, what type of animal they are. They're helpless. Without a human intervening uh, to take care of them, to feed them, to, you know, to do whatever they have to do to, to keep them healthy and happy. And then you have uh, these folks that uh, thrive, you know, on stepping on a puppy or throwing a cat out of a window or running over a dog with a car, and they think they're promoting the good. No, you're promoting somebody that most likely, if they had the chance, would do the same to a child. You're absolutely right. And I'm not about to do that. I'm not about to do no. that. I'm Me working, I'm working, I, I, I'm working I don't, in the dark here right now. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You the electric bill. No, no. Somebody in the family blew a breaker. So ah. every, everything has gone dark here. It's actually kind of mysterious and almost a little bit sexy around here right now. That, that could be cool. Yeah. But no, I, I, no, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I don't, I don't, I don't care for that stuff. I don't, um, I don't care for the people I promoted. I've, I've had some people I've blocked for the same reason. Yeah. Um, especially some of those that come out of China, you know, they're just ridiculous. I'm going like, ah, no way. Uh, oh, yes. so, um, I agree. And, well, no, the, those people are just weird. I mean, uh, and I, I really do believe if, you know, if they could do that to a helpless animal, they could do that to a helpless child. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I fully agree. I fully agree with what's going on. Come on in. See, the breaker box is in the old uh, Spaced Out Radio studio here. So we ah. ha- so we're, we're actually... Uh, oh, my daughter's in here right now. She is trying to figure out which one. It's the red one. The one that's turned red, probably. Yeah, just flip it the other way and then flip it back. Flip it the other, and then flip it back. Now she's hitting every breaker. She, don't just hit every breaker. There, you, there, we go. there you go. I don't need you taking me out here. Well, come on over here. No, no, come on over here. No, you can explain to everybody what you did to blow the breaker. Yo, you, you did it. You did it. Rotten kids. You know, if she wasn't an A student and athletic and musical, well, by golly, I'd, I'd tell her to get a job and start paying rent. I really would. I really would. Yeah. Uh, it's ter- yeah, oh, you're kid. you're cranked tonight. <laughs> oh, I'm feeling I'm feeling good tonight. You know, that that whole thing, my friend, that whole thing, you know, where that lady just absolutely made me, you know, post her name on my Facebook. So hopefully she's going to get get it from the spaced out radio listeners here coming up here. You know. Uh, I'm sure she will. Oh yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Oh, we're looking good now. And they blew the breaker again. What the hell are they doing? Blowing the breaker again. I'm in the dark. I'm in the dark. You know? I I don't know what they're doing. See? Oh, my God. This is what happens when you get the mother-in-law coming on over and she starts playing with buttons. Starts playing with buttons. Uh What What did you do this time? I'm on a live radio show here. Live radio show, and you're bugging me. Okay, whatever you guys are doing up there has to stop, man. You're lucky you're an A student. You're lucky you're an A student. <laughs> oh, rotten girl. Rotten girl. I love her to death. Love her to death. I was so just going to say, you got to love her. Oh, yeah. Yes. But then, remember, that's why lions eat their young. You know what? I've, I've actually been pretty fortunate. Both my daughters have uh, been very, very good at school. Very good at school. You know, the type of grades that, that a parent, you know, kind of looks the other way when they do something bad because there's, there's too many yeah. a, A's on the report card. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah, been there and done that. I'm, yeah. I'm very fortunate. My grandkids are the same way. They're very... Very astute, very athletic, very good at what they do, and um, I'm very proud of them. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I had a little problem, my friend. 
I was doing my Facebook Live, and I was doing the tour around my yard, and I found another garden gnome in my garden. Uh-oh. That's two now. I think they're multiplying. <laughs> I think they're multiplying. I don't like it. I think... I, I think you have friends that are keeping you busy with that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But if this becomes a tradition where all of a sudden there's a bunch of, you know, I wake up one morning and there's like 75 garden gnomes, I am putting the for sale sign up as quickly as I possibly can. As possible. Hey, but next door to me. Oh, maybe. Maybe. I got to get that yeah. gr- I got to get that green card. I don't want to be one of them illegal aliens. Trump doesn't like those. <laughs> Who's uh, no, we'll we'll get that worked out for you. No problem there. Uh, John is asking, who's my top suspect? My top suspect, Bazooka Joe. Bazooka Joe, my Bigfoot guy. He is my top suspect in this. <laughs> yeah, and he just posted, wonder where that came from. Yeah, I'm sure you don't even know. I'm sure you are blind to it. But anyways, Butch, we have you on the final Monday of every month to talk all things cryptid. And, you know, Butch, for people who have never listened to this show or heard you for the first time, I want to bring you in here. Kind of give a little background on how you got into all of this. Well, it started back in 1989. Uh, We were living in Arizona and Tucson. And um, I had some guys come in to the house, um, in, onto the property to plant some saguaro cactuses, and they were all done. It was very hot. It was about, it was still daylight. It was like 6.30, something like that, 7 o'clock at night. And my wife went in to get everybody a good cold drink, and everybody's out, and they're standing in the driveway just talking. I'm looking across the street at my neighbor, and I'm looking across the, the way at my other neighbor, and everybody's you know outside doing their thing. And above a mountain uh, is this craft. Uh, it's very large. It's extremely large. It's it's a couple football fields in length. It's five or six, maybe seven stories high. It's like a burnt bronze in color. Uh, there's a couple of very faded green lights on the side. It's just hovering there. It's absolutely quiet. And I'm looking at everybody else. And they're all looking at it, too. I look across the street. My neighbor's looking at that. I look across this guy. He's looking at it. Everybody's looking at it. And then it just silently rose up. And we watched this thing for a good, I'm going to, you know, I thought about it many times. I'm going to say probably about a good two minutes maybe three, and it just silently rose up, maybe about 1,500 feet above the mountain, and it shot off into the west like a bullet. I mean, it was gone. And uh, I yelled across the street to my neighbor because he was head of federal prisons for the whole western United States. I said, did you see that? And he said, yeah. He said, i got to make some calls. So I went in and started making some calls. I called all the radio stations, TV stations. I called the uh, DPS, Department of Public Safety. I called the Highway Patrol. I called Davis Mothman Air Force Base. I called uh, the the two airports, uh, Marana Airport, uh, which is a CIA operation. I mean, I called everybody I could think of. Nobody saw anything. There wasn't even a report. And I'm going like, no, that's crap. I ain't buying that. So I, at that point, started looking into the UFO uh, phenomenon and um, all I did for many years was accumulate a lot of books and a lot of paper wasn't getting anywhere so I joined MUFON became a state section director chief investigator star team member thinking that that wouldn't help me out and it did to a point I mean it got me in contact with other people uh, got to attend conferences uh, probably meet with people I probably would have never met with on my own but there was something lacking. Uh, I wasn't getting um, the information that I really needed for my research. And, um, you know, I, 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 was, I was beyond the point of where you would just take a report, file a report, and that would be the end of the report. If I took a report, I wanted to follow it from the beginning to the very end till there was no more to go. So in 2009, I left MUFON and uh, started the UFO Research Center in Pennsylvania with a whole bunch of like-minded researchers, which I already got to know over all those years. And we have 12 affiliates in the United States, two in Europe. And it just works out real good for us because um, what I can do is if I, if I get in a jam or if I, I get into something that I'm not familiar with, I can throw an email out to the whole group of researchers and even though some of them are involved in it much longer than I have been, I'm in it 29 years, I guess I guess it is, but there's folks out there who have been in it longer than I have. And they cover the gamut of, you know, parapsychology, law, uh, 
police work, uh, airline work. I mean, just just a, a very large gamut of different backgrounds. And I can get an answer, or I cannot get an answer. Uh, um, I just like the idea of doing it that way. It's worked out really well for us. Um, it keeps everybody on their toes, pretty much, because, you know, everybody sees what everybody else is doing. And there's no outside influences uh, that get involved, like, you know, I'm not getting emails from people that have their agenda or want to tell me what they think it is or how it should be or what we should investigate. And uh, it's, uh, that's where it all started, and it's brought me where I am today. Butch, you've heard so many odd, weird stories in your time as a police officer comparatively to now. What, what makes you scratch your head more? Was it back then when you heard some really bad stories from some criminals or some people who just called you the police out of the sake of it, or was it what you're hearing these days? No, it's th- it these days, absolutely. I mean, uh, some of the stories and reports, although very valid and check out, are really totally weird, and they're getting weirder. You have, um, you know, at the onset of the uptake in UFO sightings, which has happened over the last pretty much year and a half, two years, uh, the uptake on um, missing persons, the uptake on abductions, the uptake on uh, cryptozoology in all facets, the update of the paranormal, uh, you know, the ghosts and all that stuff. I mean, everything is just, it keeps building. It just seems like every year it keeps building. I've talked to other researchers about that. And they all say the same thing. You know, um, I, I noticed an uptake on abductions about a year and a half ago, and I got a hold of uh, Dr. David Jacobs, and I asked him if he, because he gets a lot of reports, and I said, you know, I've got like a 10% increase in these reports over the last year and a half. And he said, well, let me look and check, and I'll get back to you, which he did the next day. He said, you're right. He said, I'm up 20%. I went, why is that? He said, I ain't got a clue. And see that, and that's another thing with all of this. You get to the point where you have uh, so much information that sometimes that's a bad thing because one rolls into the other, and then you start to get you know your investigation and your research starts to get um, I always call it kerfuddled, where you know one's leading into another one, but it doesn't mean anything. But now you got to figure that out, and it takes you time to do that. But we've always done it, all our investigations and research, in a forensic way. So uh, no matter what kind of investigation it is or report, we go back and start forensically. So we'll do a background check on the location. We'll look for old reports. We'll look for photographs. We'll search databases for that area um, and then take it from there. I mean, if it's a, if it's has something to do with a property or a home, we'll do, you know, all the search on the property and that kind of stuff. Um, It just, it takes a lot of work. And, you know, I know there's a lot of folks out there that are, you know, involved in research and investigation, and some of them are extremely good. On the other hand, there are some that are extremely bad. And when I say that, I don't mean that nastily. I mean, they, they're they satisfied with whatever answer they get, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, but they're satisfied with that answer. And you can't do that. You can't be satisfied with one answer. It's That's too easy. It doesn't happen that way. And um, it has to do with um, a lot of study, a lot of, a lot of time with your nose in a book or the library or newspapers or archives or, or databases. And although I see there are a lot of good researchers out there that will do that, there's still a lot out there that won't do that. You know, they're more uh, apt to tell you that, well, you know, that thing you saw, well, that's a blah, blah, blah. And I've seen 100 reports like that. And But when you ask them what they think it is, I mean, you get that blank stare or the silence on the phone or no answer at all on the email. So it's... I. I try to push as much as I can when I get involved in an investigation to get the person or persons involved in the report to get involved with the investigation. That's very important. 
I want to know everything they thought. I want to know everything they saw. I want to know where it happened. I don't want to get all the information on email or or uh, by the phone, although sometimes that's the only way to do it. Uh, I want to be on site. I want to look at it. I want to see what they, you know, where they saw it. Was it possible? What the weather was at the time of the sighting, and um, and that goes for the crypto side too, you know, uh, and it goes for the paranormal. Uh, it just takes a lot of work um, and the wherewithal to get it done. That's a very important thing too. Butch, I mean, we, I've seen people. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say we always see these things in the paranormal field being cyclical. Okay, when the Two of the Stars campaign came out, it was all about um, disclosure and all about trying to get, you know, what we know from the government. Previous to that, it was all about ghosts and then demons and then, you know, Flat Earth. And then we have the more, uh, you know, the mandela effect there always seems to be a cycle here which cycle are we in right now because from what i'm seeing on my side i don't see a lot of ufo reports i don't see a lot of really good paranormal stories coming out it seems like we're in a real lull right now uh in the last three maybe four months it has been a lull um i i believe uh these things, it's just like, and I'll use the bipedal canine reports for an example. Uh, we'll get hammered. We'll get four or five at a time in, 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 a, in a very large area. And then we won't get anything for months and months. And, and you know, you're just like ready to, like, close the file or maybe, you know, move it over on the far side of the desk. And then you'll get one or two. And then you'll get three and four. And then you'll get five and six. And then all of a sudden, you haven't had a UFO report in months and you'll get five or six in a week. So it's very strange, but what I do have realized over time is that the best times that we get, or the times that are the best reporting times that people see what they see, whether it's in the sky or on the ground, is clear cold weather for UFOs and uh, beginning of the summer, throughout the summer, and into the fall for things in the woods. Now, the things in the woods, uh, there's a lot of misidentification. I mean, you get somebody out of New York City that's lived in Brooklyn all their life, and they go to the Catskills, and they see something big and brown run across the road. That's Bigfoot. (laughs) No, it's not Bigfoot. It's probably a deer. And um, it's... uh, it's very strange. Uh, there are uh, the kind of periods of nothing happening, and then even though nothing was reported, you know, it may be July, and somebody's telling you about something they saw back in December or September, and that's that's when it really gets a little crazy. You doing okay there? Because I know you're. You're battling some bronchitis. Are you okay there, Butch? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. All right. All right. So what do you think leading into 2018 here as we start getting ever so closer? I mean, we're starting May now. You know, we're five months into this month, this year, and really there hasn't been a real focal point of the paranormal. Where do you see it going here? Uh, I think you'll shortly start to see the... Uh, the cryptozoology stuff coming in now because people are, you know, they're getting on vacation, they're getting ready to go on vacation. You got a holiday coming up, big holiday weekend. Uh, you know, you're out, you're out and about. And that's, that's when the sightings come in. Uh, we are watching a couple areas that have been hot for us. Um, we have a couple things planned, uh, for early, uh, September and into late October. Uh, where we'll be out in the field for probably about two or three weeks and um, uh, going to try a couple new techniques, <laughs> of course, always trying something new. So uh, now if we would be in December and January and we had really cold and clear, cold weather and clear skies, we'd have, we'd have a half a ton of UFO reports. Now, of course, you're going to have airplanes, you know, the known sightings, um, airplanes and 
and bolides and meteors and uh, satellites and all that stuff. But it just seems like when it's clear and cold, and that goes from December, or, well, from actually from October, uh, November, December, January, and February, when you really have cold, clear weather, uh, clear skies, that's when we get a lot of UFO reports. March, I think, was a pretty good month for some of the outfits that do nothing but UFOs. Um, but like I said, we only had a few. And um, I, 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 there, I don't think there's really an explanation for it other than, it's, it, like you said, it's cyclical. And um, it's just like the, you mentioned disclosure. Disclosure comes up every two years. I don't, I don't care who's doing it, who's going to disclose what. But it comes up every two years. And it's been that way as far back as I can remember. Uh, next year we're going to tell you this, or next month we're going to bring this up, or next month after that we're going to do this. But it never happens. So when people say, do I believe in disclosure? We already know there's something up there that's not ours. So if that's disclosure, that's disclosure. But now people are looking for, well, are there reptilians running around amongst us? Um uh, is my brother-in-law an alien, you know, that kind of stuff. And it, it gets a little crazy. I, I think people carry it to the nth, and there's no rational thought about it. You know, uh, I, I just read a story a little bit ago um, where a guy thinks his friend, who he's known all his life, is a werewolf and has seen him change from a human to a werewolf. Now, I don't know what this guy's drinking or smoking, but, I mean, he's been with this young fellow. They've been together as, uh, um, what do you say, uh, you know, neighbors, school chums, and everything else for 20-some years. All of a sudden, this guy's a werewolf. Now, the, da- the, the background on that is this gentleman who claims his friend is a werewolf is now writing a book. So that answers a lot to me. Of course. When I, when I hear the book, um, you know, when somebody starts talking about a book, and don't get me wrong, there are a lot of good researchers out there that do write books, and I read them and I buy them. Um, uh, there's some guys that I, I really like what they say and how they say it, and there's some guys I don't, you know. Uh, if you're going to do research, tell me about your research in your book. Don't tell me you got the information off the Internet, because we all know that everything on the Internet is true. So um, I'm, it's, noti- it's, I'm noting your sarcasm there. <laughs> well, it, it, it makes me a little crazy, you know, when I have to not argue, but I have to defend myself uh, with somebody that's making a report that's telling me it's absolutely true because it's on the Internet. And I'm going like, no, it's not. And they're going like, yes, it is. And so, you know, I kind of cut them short, and that's the end of it. But um, it's the people that come to you uh, whether it's a Bigfoot report or a, a bipedal report or a large something large flying in the sky or uh, a UFO report or a, par- a paranormal experience or an abduction. After a while, you pretty much know you're dealing with something that could be real, that could have happened. It's possible just from the way they talk or the way they present themselves to you. But when they start out with, look, I know this is true, I saw it on the Internet, and I'm writing a book about it, and my buddy is, uh, that I grew up with is a werewolf. Okay, well, that's probably a book I'm not going to buy. Before we get too heavy into this show, I realize that a lot of people around the online radio world have been doing tributes to Art Bell over, well, since it's been 16, 17 days now since the radio legend passed. I wanted to give you a few minutes because you are such a loyalist to this show to maybe talk about what your thoughts on Art Bell were. Well, (laughs) it's kind of funny because I listened to Art Bell for a long time. Um, And um, one afternoon I was sitting here at my desk and the phone rang and I looked over at the ID and it's someplace in Nevada, I'm going like, okay, so who's this? I pick it up, and it was the radio station, Art Bell station at that time, and he wanted to interview me, and I'm thinking to myself, lady, you got the wrong number, 
you know, I'm I'm a nobody. I'm I'm just a you know I'm just out here doing my thing. I'm I'm not the kind of people that you have on your show. And no, nope, Art Bell wants you on the show. I said okay. She said I will get back to you at the time and the date. And about two days later, I got an email to call, and I called, and um, I got the date. And he wanted to do the whole show, all four hours with me. And this was back in 2010. And uh, so he was living in the Philippines at the time. Uh, I'm living over here, of course. And so the time difference was really strange. I mean, by the time he was done with me, because you know how Art was. Art started on questions, and he just kept firing the questions. And as long as you were giving him an answer, you were good. I think Art was one of those guys that if he smelled any BS, he would burn you in a heartbeat. So I got through my four hours with Art Bell and um, kind of passed it off as like, okay, so it was really my, it was really actually my very first radio interview. And so I got through it, I felt good about it, and I got a letter from, an email from him about a month later. And he says, I have, over time, interviewed very few people for four hours. And he said, and they go into a special archive, and he gave me the name of the archive on the station. And he said, I've placed you in that archive. And I thought, well, that's pretty nice, pretty neat. And um, I've been on four or five times now with different people, but only once with Art. And um, I liked Art for the fact that Art was straight up. You know what I mean? Um, he called a spade a spade. Uh, he was knowledgeable about what he was asking and talking about. Uh, he didn't stammer around and throw out weird stuff, you know, like, so uh, this bipedal canine, does he have big fangs or blue eyes or what? You know, nah, none of that stuff. Uh, our whole four hours were basically on human mutilation, cattle mutilation, and UFOs. And uh, I knew he was in bad health. Uh, I had heard that from a few people. And his passing did shock me a little bit. But art will always be there. His archives are there. Um, I understand that there is somebody, and I'm not really sure of this, but I understand there's somebody that is actually going to put all of his shows in a set of CDs all of his shows, and um, where he interviewed one person for four hours or he interviewed four person for one hour each. It, they're all going to be there. I don't know that person. I can't even remember the name at the moment, but I really think that researchers, and I don't care how long they've been in it. I don't care if they're in it since yesterday or 25 years ago. Some of the stuff he talks about and some of the questions that Art has always asked is the questions that a researcher and investigator should be asking also. I mean, that's basically what he did, what he'd done. He was a, um, a researcher. I don't know how much of an investigator, but a researcher. He knew what he was talking about. He asked the right questions, and uh, people liked it. Um, some people didn't like him. Some people do love him. Uh, I, I really liked him. I, uh, you know, I kept the correspondence between him and I in a file. And I was very proud to be on a show with him, and um, he will be missed. He's, he was a good guy in my book. It definitely leaves a big hole in the entire landscape of what we do. That is for sure, even though he hadn't been on the air for a couple of years. But it's one of those things, my friend, where you know you do have to pay attention to what is going on and you know retired or not arts legacy legacy pardon me and uh, being a pioneer of bringing these topics to the forefront on a quality journalism level it was unheard of it was a he was a, a lone wolf along a very lonely path of of laughing jokers uh, surrounding him and he looked everybody in the eye and said told you I made you. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, and not only that, but you know, the very first I can remember the very first time I heard the show. Uh, I was working, uh, and um, I went out on my break, and um, I thought, eh, just sit in the car and turn on the radio because it was a little cold to stand outside. So I turned it on. I got Art Bell show, and uh, first time I ever heard him, and I went like, this is wild. 
So I only had like 15 minutes, so I went back to work. And then when I was done, got back in my car, and I was heading home, and I turned the radio back on. He was still there. I'm going like, how long is this guy's show on? And so, you know, after I looked into it, I figured out it was a four-hour show. And, uh, you know, there are, uh, I, don't call the, I don't call people like Art or you DJs. I, 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 don't, see, I don't see you guys as DJs. Uh, I see you guys as uh, information gatherers and um, the, uh, you have the wherewithal via whatever you're doing, whether it's uh, TV or radio or whatever, to get the information out and to challenge people on the information and to inform people. And a lot more of that is needed in all this phenomena because, you know, you, th- th- that super secret society, which I think exists in pretty much all of it, you know, uh, well, I had this great sighting, but I can't tell you about it. It's hush-hush, you know. There might be, the military might be involved, or there, it might be a government thing, or, I don't, you know, I don't want to disappear with the men in black. And I'm going like, wow, <laughs> you know. Uh, but I, I, I think there will always be a place for the new art bells of the world, and... Um, they are a lot of fun to listen to. Uh, sometimes you get some good information that you didn't really know about. You know, it kind of slips in there or somebody slips it in on the show. And uh, I, I still listen to, you know, whatever whatever I can uh, that is um, involved with the paranormal in general. And I think all of this is paranormal. I don't think any of it is... Uh, just cryptozoology or just demonology or just it's all it it all has to be connected somehow there's just too much of it and there's too many crossovers uh things that happen in cryptozoology also happen in the paranormal things that happen in paranormal also happen in ufology things that happen in ufology also happen in in uh other things so you know if if you're saying that it's not connected I, I just think you're defeating your own purpose because what you want to do is keep an open mind always. I don't I don't care what you're looking at. Just keep an open mind and try to get as much information as you can. And there's enough guy there's enough guys out there, there's enough researchers, both guys and girls, that you can, you know, email them, get on their website, send them an email, uh, make a phone call, uh get to their Facebook or Twitter and ask them a question. You know, uh if you have a question, ask somebody that's been at it for a while. Don't ask the guy about the werewolf in the book. You don't want that story. You don't want not that on, story at all, my friend. No, or, no, no not at all. Let's move on to our, our next topic because I think um, I'm pretty sure our listeners, after every single night we've done a little bit of a tribute to art, I wanted to give you the final word on that, and I think you ended it absolutely beautifully, my friend, and thank you so much for giving your opinion. Moving into the strange and the weird... We had David Weatherly on last week where he was asked a question by someone in our audience in regards to these stairways that are being found in the middle of forests. And people who seem to approach these stairways are hit with a really weird sense of energy, like if they try to walk up these stairways, that something bad or something lurking is going to come around. Have you ever heard of these stairways? Uh, yes, and I've seen one. <laughs> no way. Oh, yeah. Uh, those stories have not been around a long time. I'm going to say maybe five, six years at the most. Uh, they're usually uh, in the middle of nowhere, uh, in state parks, game lands, uh, just general heavily wooded areas. Um, some are wood. Um, I've read stories of some that are metal. Um, the one that we ran into, uh, was in the Susquehanna state forest and, uh, we were just doing our thing, you know, looking for some prints and stuff. And there was this stairwell right out in the middle of the woods. Uh, it was, a uh, uh, when we got, I mean, when you looked at it from where we were standing, it just looked like a standing stairwell. When we got closer and started really looking at it, you could see where it was at one time attached to a wall, and the wall had fallen 
but the way the stairwell was attached to the base, and it was all stone, and to what was left of the wall, that's what was supporting that stairwell. But now the ones that are made out of wood, and people say, well, they look like they're new, and um, uh, or the metal ones. That's just that's just totally weird to me. But uh, we uh, took pictures of the stairwell or uh, the stairs. There were uh, twelve steps up, uh, kind of a little bend in the middle. Uh, not a big sharp bend, but you know, just kind of like a the beginning of a a turn. And uh, we walked up. It was it supported two of us, and the two of us probably weighed about you know six hundred pounds. And um, we looked around. But the, but the weird thing was, and it still kind of bugs us till today. Even though there was a support wall, sort of what was left of a support wall, and the stairwell, we could find no foundation for a building at all. There was just none. There was no. Uh, loading dock if it would have been a uh, you know a building that may have been used for um, uh, manufacturing or if it was a homestead at one point uh, there was just no foundation I mean there was even a, there wasn't even anything that looked like a foundation you know there was no no straight edges here and a straight edge there and maybe this parts missing or anything like that or a burned out building no it, it was just this stairwell uh, set of stairs with this kind of a support wall, which originally was probably all the way up to the top. Now those rocks from the support wall were laying at the base on the outside, but we found no foundation at all. So that to me was always weird why there wasn't any foundation. There should have been. If I mean, if it had stone steps and a stone wall, there had to be a stone foundation, correct? You would think so. I mean, that's just logical. Yeah, and uh, there was nothing. We couldn't find anything. I mean, we dug around. Uh, you know, uh, move stuff, move tree, you know, some tree stumps laying there dead and stuff like that. We moved all that around, but there, there was just no, no, um, remarkable or unremarkable, <laughs> uh, a piece of, uh, of a foundation. So that, that is weird. We have been back in that area. Uh, I think it was three years ago. It's still there. I mean, it hasn't, nothing's moved. I mean, it hasn't fallen down or, uh, the um, uh, there's been no loss to that wall. I mean, what we looked at our pictures and it's still there. I mean, it's just the way we saw it. We did look in the background to see, you know, if it was, you know, part of something at one point, and we couldn't find anything in the county records, uh, property records at all. So we don't know what it was, or or maybe it was just something that maybe you know somebody just started to build and gave up on it, or. It shouldn't be there to begin with, which is kind of scary. As Dennis says in the chat room, maybe possible old movie sets that were never removed? Well, yeah, but this wouldn't be that type of area because, I mean, it's, it, that's possible. But why would somebody build stone? You know, if it was a movie set, they'd probably use wood, make it, you know, paint it up to look like stone. But it just... It just it's out of the it's it's out of the norm. I mean, if you see steps or you see like a an old doorway, if you look around, you're going to see the foundation to a house, or you'll see remnants of the roof that fell in or something. There's always something you find, or maybe a cold cellar. But with this one, there was nothing. I mean, there was just no foundation. There was no like a pathway or a walkway up to the steps. I mean, they're just there, and with an attached piece of wall. So what it is. I, I, I have no idea. Uh, and the, as far as these metal ones and the wood ones that they're finding out in the West Coast in deep forest, where, like the one report I read, the guy said it looked like they were built yesterday. Now, could it be somebody just trying to be a jerk? Yeah, could be. You know, somebody found a set of steps and they just took them out and set them up in the woods somewhere. Yeah, possible. But there's stories go back a long way on where people... I, I remember one story I'm not real familiar with it anymore. It's been a long time, but where somebody walked up the steps, and when they got to the top, they disappeared. And then the party that was looking for this individual kind of gave up, and were heading back, and he came walking up the road. He didn't remember anything. So he was found. He was there. But they watched him walk up this uh, stairwell, and he disappeared. So 
again, that kind of leads you to the opening of doors and portals, which at one time I would have said, no way. But there's just been too many things that have happened, even some that have been videoed, that there's no explanation for. And if you would have said, well, if you realize that maybe that dark spot there where the the whatever disappeared might have been a portal, you know, you got to stop and give that some credence. Proving it probably is another story. Do you buy all this portal stuff when we hear imaginary stories of people walking up stairways in the middle of the forest and disappearing? I mean, that seems right out of a Disney fantasy movie. Hmm. Yeah, it does. Uh, I would have to see a lot more proof than just just word of mouth. Um, like I said, we walked up to the top. Nothing happened to us. Um, but there are some out there that are kind of scary. I mean, you know, where... Um, Especially that metal. I wish I could think of where that was. I don't remember if I read it in a report or if it was on the internet, but it was a metal stairway. It was found, I believe, in a Mont in a, in a pretty rocky and wooded area in Montana. And there was this metal stairway that almost looked something like uh, they would roll up to an airplane for you to board the plane. Uh, that type of configuration. And uh, it showed no support. There were, like, no legs, no nothing holding it to the ground. It was just there. And uh, the, the, the group, uh, I think it was a group of four hikers, as they walked up to it, it vanished. And they all swear and declare they're ready to take a polygraph test. You know, they're ready to do everything they can to prove that they're not crazy. But, you know, those, those stories are they're interesting, but they're kind of hard to swallow. Because there's no proof, you know, there's no, um, I know there was two researchers did go out to that location and they looked around for marks on the ground where it might have been standing and they didn't find anything. But you have the same thing on certain parts of uh, the ocean fronts, both on the east coast and the west coast, where people have seen docks appear overnight. Now, there's no dock there. I mean, it's just ocean. And they go down to the beach, and there's a dock. And they go back to tell somebody or get somebody to come and look at it, and it's gone. So where'd that go, and where'd it come from? Could there be an alternative universe? I don't know. But I, if I keep an open mind, if I keep an open mind, I would say maybe. But it's going to need a lot of proof, a lot of proof. And that's exactly what I was just going to say. I mean, you have to have an, an open mind when it comes to topics like this. And for the majority of us out there, Butch, we have a tough time doing that. I mean, it just seems so sci-fi to us that you walk up a, these stairwells and people mm -hmm. people who are going up these stairwells you know, they get to the first stair or they put their hand on the railing and all of a sudden they get this flow of energy inside them that something bad is going to happen or something cursing is going to happen and it is very uncomfortable for them. Have you talked to anybody who has found these stairwells in the middle of nowhere? Because some of the ones we're hearing are pretty elaborate, like the spiral staircases that go up. Yeah, no, I, I've not interviewed anybody like that. But what I will say is, that, you know, uh, when you say about having a bad feeling, I've had that feeling uh, on a number of occasions on different cases. And um, I don't know how to explain that. Uh, if I tried my very best, I would just have to say that I felt um, all was not right with where I was. Um, not despair or anything like that or fear, it's just like something was just not the way it should be. And I've had that along with other researchers in my presence, or I was in their presence then, had the same feeling. I don't know what that is. That could be just uh, your mind uh, playing with the unknown, um, or you're in a situation where, you know, you're in the deep, dark woods, or you're down in a basement somewhere in a sanitarium, and you hear something or see something, and then, you, you know, the mind the mind plays many tricks, even with ufology. Um, so I've had those feelings. I can't explain them. I, I 
like I said, it's not a feeling of dread or danger or anything like that. Just a feeling of something just isn't kosher. It's not right. Something is wrong. Something's out of kelter here. And then when I look for it, I don't find anything. So could that just be the mind playing a trick? Yeah, it could be. Or it could be something that you're just not aware of. So how do you prove that? We got a minute before we got to go to break here, Butch, in a very fast first hour with you as per usual. Do you think people are just using their imagination because maybe they've seen, you know, Narnia a few too many times? Yeah, I, 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 a lot of it. A lot of it comes from TV, uh, movies. Uh, I, I don't care whether it's a movie on ufology or, like, uh, right after the movie Independence Day came out, the first movie, <clears throat> there were um, the, the the UFO reports across the country and around the world spiraled. They just went out of, out of sight. Uh, when the movie Dog Soldiers came out, which was about the wolf-like uh, kind of Anubis-looking uh, creatures that were fighting some British soldiers, um, the bipedal canines started coming out. Not so much, not at all with us, but in different parts of the country where, where, where it was actually shown for the first time. So, you know, I think when you put something in somebody's mind and it is truly fearful, just like Jaws, the movie Jaws. I mean, uh, my thing with the ocean was when you enter the ocean, you're entering the food chain. And um, when the movie Jaws came out, I mean, uh, a friend of mine who's a diehard, a, guy, a diehard diver, he gave it up. He said, nope, ain't doing it. Mm -mm. I said, why? He said, he said, do you know how big that fish is? I said, yeah, but you've been in there for years. I said, you haven't seen one before? Yes, he said, I've seen many. But he said, never like that one, and never thinking what it could do. And he just quit. He packed it in. Hasn't been in the water since. Especially on the East Coast there where they find all those megalodon teeth. You just never know when that megalodon's nope. going to come out of extinction and start swimming around. Butch, I'm going to get you to hold on right there. We're going to step out for our first break of the night. Butch Witkowski from UFO Cop is our guest tonight. Butch joins us the final Monday of every, every month to talk everything cryptozoology. We'll be back right after this. Find your escape where time has no limits. It's about living today and cherishing the heritage of yesterday. A spirit of adventure for what is new with the nostalgia of the past. Your timepiece is a reflection of who you are. Life surrounded by beauty from the world around us to the soul within. EscapeWatches.com There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. The freedom to post what you want, when you want. That's the social media freedom you need. Social Media Freedom is the free app in your app store. No need to worry about going to jail or being shadow banned any longer. It's the freedom to say what you feel. The freedom to know Big Brother isn't watching. It's the way social media is supposed to be. Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Download from your app store today. Coming September 28th to the 30th, it's our first annual Caribou Paracon, put on by Spaced Out Radio and the Canadian Society of Questers. Three days of paranormal, supernatural, and spiritual knowledge in the beautiful 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia. Tickets are $150 Canadian for the event, being held at the Spruce Hills Resort and Spa. Come watch our featured speaker, Grant Cameron, along with Lorian Fenton, David Weatherly, Ross Allison, and more. The Caribou Paracon, celebrating everything paranormal. Hey, space travelers. It's Joe Roop, your host of Spaced Out Saturdays. Come join me as we explore the realms of the paranormal, the esoteric, and everything in between every Saturday night at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. You know the truth is out there. Don't get caught sleepwalking. Come join Spaced Out Saturdays. That's every Saturday night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, right here on SpacedOutRadio.com. Psychic Sundays, spiritual communication, ET contact, Sasquatch in your backyard. We will have it all on Cosmic Passport with me, Elizabeth Anglin. Each Sunday, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, at SpacedOutRadio.com. I will take you on a journey of enlightenment. 
The goal is learning from the soul on out. We'd love it if you joined our experience, Cosmic Passport, heard Sundays at spacedoutradio.com. 365 days a year, we're in the field, investigating UFO sightings, talking to alien abductees, and visiting secret military locations like Area 51. We're UFO Seekers, official partner of Spaced Out Radio. Follow our daily search for the truth at ufoseekers.com or like us on social media. Catch us on Spaced Out Radio every third Monday of the month as we discuss Area 51, UFOs, and more. And also, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. It's paranormal news at its finest. Welcome to The Encounter. At spaceoutradio.com, The Encounter online is SOR's trusted news source for everything weird and strange going on around the world. This is news editor Eric Markham. Our team of journalists are scouring the planet for those strange stories that rarely make the mainstream. No fear-mongering or fake news here. Head over to spaceoutradio.com and encounter The Encounter. Heading to Vancouver and looking for some great nightlife? The Moose Vancouver is the place to be. Catch a game on one of the big screens or just come rock out to your favorite 80s and 90s hair bands. Great food starting at $6.95. The Moose Vancouver is open until 2 a.m. nightly. It's easy to find near the corner of Nelson and Granville. The Moose Vancouver is the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. Want to learn more about aliens, cover-ups, conspiracies, cryptids, and the paranormal? All you have to do is tune in S4 as we take over the Spaced Out Radio Night, starting at midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern, each and every Saturday night, right after Spaced Out Saturdays. Hi there, this is Eric Cooper from Forest Moon Paranormal. Join me, Corey Ruiz, and friends as we discuss the hot topics of the night. It's fun, entertaining, and as dark as the night. Find us at spacedoutradio.com. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Do you want to know what's really going on in your world? Do you have questions about who you can trust in the mainstream media? Then look no further than the Rebel Planet. Come get the straight answers right here at spacedoutradio.com. Join me, Jamie Sexton, creator of Rebel Planet News, as I fill you in on the stories behind the stories. All you truth seekers, be sure to tune in to Rebel Planet on spacedoutradio.com the third Thursday of every month. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy on your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. And hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Welcome back to the second hour of Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Great to have you back. Tomorrow night on the program, Geraldine Orozco is going to join us for the spiritual you. We're going to get into our Zen, our Chi, find our inner self. 
It's going to be great. If you haven't heard Geraldine speak yet, you're in for a real treat. 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. We want to welcome in everyone listening in on WQEE 99 Rock the Key down in Noonan, Georgia, home of the Walking Dead. We are live as well on the United Public Radio Network, 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. We are also live at spacedoutradio.com. Spreaker, and you can catch us live on the Fringe FM, or you can watch us live on Periscope.tv. Check out our archives at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Cressmomancy. Cressmomancy is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, Space Travelers, as Bill sets the password each and every night right here at the Mighty S.O.R. Now, if you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We're all over the place. Our website, once again, spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to some Bumblefoot. Shop at our Spaced Out Radio store. Read the encounter online. Or watch great videos from UFO Seekers, Contact TV, and so much more. It's the final Monday of the month, which means we have Butch Witkowski from UFO Cop coming on in for his segment. We like to call it around these parts Strange Days. Butch is one of the premier investigators in North America about all things strange, cryptid, obtuse. Butch, welcome back. Thank you, sir. We were talking about these weird stairwells that people are finding in the middle of forests, in the middle of nowhere. Butch, there are people who are claiming when they see these stairwells, they maybe put it on their GPS, they may mark it, or they may leave a mark, or whatever they may do. They may go into that forest all the time hunting or just you know, looking for treasures or, or whatever it may be. And when they go back, those stairwells are gone. What do you think is causing mm-hmm. that? Well, you know, I out of the few that I've read, uh, there have been maybe four or five that were that scenario where people marked them, they marked the site, they GPSed them, they did whatever they had to do to get to go back and photograph it or do something, and they went back and they weren't there anymore. Now, when you're talking about like the stone stairwell that we saw, that'd be kind of tough to move that. It's still there. So I'm thinking that that's going to be a bona fide reason that it's there. We're just missing it. It it was either a house or it was a building of some sort, and it just, over time, was just, you know, taken apart. But there are some, like you said, where uh, you have um, a a, a person goes or, 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 you know, they see something, they document it, they photograph it, they do whatever they got to do, and then they go back. And it's not there anymore. Now, to me, that's bizarre. So there again, you're bringing in that the port portal uh, scenario, or or something um, like that. Um, I it's it's very hard to put your finger on any of that stuff because there's just not enough research and evidence into it. It's like um, many years ago. When crop circles first appeared, there was one or two, maybe. Then all of a sudden, there was this plethora of sightings and and reports and photographs of crop circles in England. And that kind of died out. Uh, I haven't seen a a new crop circle report in years, really. Um, The one we had, uh, the only one that was ever documented in Pennsylvania was documented by a MUFON uh, investigator, uh, down near York in York County, and um, I, you know, you look at it and it, yeah, everything was you know, it looked it wasn't a design; it was just down. The the the, the wheat was down, and um, uh, I live in a very rural area here. Um, I'm I'm in the middle of the Amish country, so there are a lot of fields, a lot of different crops, and I was driving home one time. I, I went to the post office and I was coming home the back road and something caught my eye and I pulled over and actually walked into the field and there were like eight circles, right? Perfect circles. I'm going like, what the hell is that? You know? And what it turned out was, uh, it's an air downburst. 
And when I checked with um, Penn State Weather and a couple other people that are more involved in that stuff, they said the same thing. Yeah, there, there was a, a series of downbursts in that part of the county, uh, the lower part of the county, and in another county where they had the same thing. So a natural phenomenon, which is happening all the time and has happened all the time, is now this great mystery. And it's, it is, you have to really look at everything when you're looking at something like that. Like when I looked at it, I thought, wow, crop circles. <laughs> and, but they were too perfect. I mean, there was no, nobody, if anybody would have walked in there, I would have saw it. If anybody would have drove in there, I would have saw it. There was no footprints or anybody wading through that wheat. And uh, when you um, backed up and got on a little rise across the road and you could look down into that field, there were six perfect circles. And uh, it turned out to be they were just uh, a, a downdraft, basically, uh, a, a burst of air from a weather condition. And there is a name for it, and I apologize. I don't remember what it's called, but it's just a, a basically a burst of air that um, would come down similar to a tornado, but not that big and not that powerful, but it will come down in a number of places at one time, and it will it's just a spinning of air. So if it hits, you know, um, young wheat or something like that, it'll just knock it down in a circle, and then it, they go away. They just go back up into the sky. But like I was saying, you know, just like with the stairs, which has just come about, there have been old reports, but there, there are new reports coming about. I know that. But um, it's just, there's so many things that are so simple to figure out, and yet you can stand there for hours scratching your head and going like, mm, I ain't got a clue. Um, uh, just like Robert just said, dust devils. Uh, you know, I used to see those out in Arizona all the time. And a dust devil, they don't come down and stay in a spot. So they don't leave that type of a mark like a circle. They move. So they will uh, go across, you know, from one side of the road to the other. Uh, and the minute they hit the, the, the sand or the dirt or the gravel, you know, they m make a mark. But it's not a circle. The, these bur air bursts, they call them, uh, they come down uh, just like a tornado. They just come down, they touch, and they, go, they fall apart. They just there's nothing to bind them. There's not enough bad weather, or there's not enough atmospheric wind to make them continue on like a tornado would. So it, it's there's a lot of strange things out there, and you know some of this stuff really fascinates me to hell. I mean, I get nuts. <laughs> I start looking, start looking at stuff and talking to people and asking questions. And sometimes I think when I call those people up at Penn State Weather, they probably think, "Oh, it's him again. <laughs> now what?" <laughs> but um, that's one of the reasons we 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 actually have our own weather station in the truck. It's a full blown weather station. It's uh, it's wireless. We can sit in the truck and watch the weather. Uh, it updates itself every couple seconds. I think it's three point four seconds. It updates. Uh, it gives me all the information what's going on out in the, out in the field or wherever I have the weather station set up. And weather is very important because just like with one of the bipedal reports that we worked on where we were out in the field, we had the weather changing. Uh, the wind was changing from north, south, and then east, west. And I kept looking at the monitor in the truck, and I'm going like, this ain't kosher, something's not right here. How can the wind be changing north, south, east, west? It's not southwest, east, west, no, nothing like that. It's north, direct north, direct south, direct east, direct west. So when I got home, uh, a few days uh, later, I called up there, and I was talking to the head meteorologist, and I explained to him what happened. And he says, mm, yes, that happens all the time. But unfortunately, it only happens in the Himalayas. I went, oh. He said, so were you in the Himalayas? I went, mm, not really. I was in Clearfield, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and he says, that's bizarre. He said, that's all I can tell you. He said, it shouldn't be. So there are little things that happen in investigations where you can't get an answer. Like he couldn't tell me why, but he did tell me, you know, like Mount Everest, you, you would find that that would happen on Mount Everest. It would happen in the Himalayas. Any tall, very high mountain would cause that to happen because of the way the mountain ranges lie and the speed of the wind. And, you know, 
so you've got wind going north south and then it'll change up and go east west but he said that shouldn't happen in Pennsylvania so that's an, that's just another bizarre thing that happened during that investigation that we can't explain and there is no explanation I mean I can't explain it and I'm not going to go to the Himalayas to find out I actually have a guy named Nelson Dellis coming on in July, Butch, and you you got to make sure you listen to this story. He'll be coming on on July 5th, and this guy has tried climbing Mount Everest twice. I don't know if he made it the second time, but the first time he got up to Camp 4, or Camp 3 or Camp 4, where he almost died on the mountain. So it's... Oh. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about everything weird on Mount Everest on July 5th. I mean, there's there's, uh, there's some scary, spooky stuff going on there, and that's not just even the Yeti reports. There are a lot of people that die on Everest. I mean, some of them yeah. don't even, you know, they, they, they may get out of base camp, and they never make it to the second camp, and they're dead. They either fall off the side, or they have an oxygen problem, or a health problem, and they're gone. Never mind those ice cliffs that you have to cross over via a thin ladder that are oh, yeah. uh, that are like a 300-foot drop or more right yeah. into an icy and abyss. That's terrible. I, I I read somewhere just not too long ago where there's like still like 250 bodies up on the mountain. They never brought down. Yeah. They're that's there. Wh- I mean, that's, w- that's one of the ones we want to talk about that night because there's a lot of weird stuff and, and superstition that goes up on Everest and and it is true when because you're in what they call the death zone if you mm-hmm. die in there even if you are close to death in there they cannot rescue you they cannot no you no, are they stuck. uh yeah in the one story i was reading uh there was a uh, two climber it was two climbers they both were killed uh one actually something happened and his is his, his rope got tangled up or something like that, and he basically hung himself off the side of a cliff. He's been there for 30 years. There's no way they can get him. He's just hanging up there like a popsicle. And the other guy uh, fell to the bottom, and I, I, I think they said he died of hypothermia and broken legs. But people saw this happen, and there was nothing they could do for them. They just watched him die. And that, you know, I don't know what kind of mentality you have to have going into doing something like that. I have no, I mean, when I get up on a stepladder, I get a little goofy. But, uh, you know, to watch somebody die and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, you just continue on. Well, the oxygen levels up there are something like 30% what they are at ground level. 30%. 30%. That's why it takes two months to get up there, because you need to be able to pressurize your body, and your body has to get used to every different level before you make a run at the mountain. And there's only a two-week, three-week window where you can actually make the climb up to Everest. Yeah, and and also that they they have I think I think it said there are actually four twenty-four-seven, three-sixty-five rescue teams with helicopters on call at all times during the season. And the guy that I was listening to his conversation when he was saying, you know, he said, if we have 100 people stranded on the mountain or some type of maybe an injury or oxygen deprivation or something like that, he said, if we save 10 or 12, he said, that's a good number. And I went like, holy crap. Yeah, it's scary indeed. We're going to learn about that in just about two months' time here. That's how far booked ahead we are right now. We're doing pretty good here on the show. I got a question. Getting back to the stairwells here, I got a question from yeah. Gloria in the SOR Space Traveler. She's saying, but she has heard that people are told not to talk about these stairwells. Have you heard that as well? Uh, I've heard that about everything. I've heard that about cryptozoology. I've heard it about demonology. I've heard it about the stairwells. I've heard it about crop circles. I've heard it about everything. I don't know where that comes from that people say they're not allowed to talk about it, or if they talk about it, something bad is going to befall them. But that's pretty much been around for a long time. Uh, You'll have somebody that will send you a report, 
and you know it's very good uh, it's got information maybe photographs video whatever and at the very last line they'll say now that's all you're getting out of me you're never going to hear from me again because if I keep talking about this something really bad's going to happen I've had that happen a number of times I don't know what that is I I, I just kind of put that off as um, that individual's fear of the unknown or fear of what they saw and they you know have no answer for it so they gave you the information and they expect you to do whatever you want with it. We're going to move on topics here because recently, and normally we talk a lot of cryptids with you, but every now and again there's a little bit of news that pops up with a former group you were associated with, MUFON. And last week there was a gentleman by the name of Chris Cogswell, I believe out of California. He was just on the show with Joe Roop on Saturday night. He quit... MUFON, after finding out that MUFON had not kept to their word and ridded themselves of John Ventry and the racist overtures that he made. Maybe if you could take a couple minutes, just kind of break that scenario down if you did see it for us. Uh, Well, uh, I believe he uh, came on board in MUFON in January and um, I don't know what his title was. I can't remember. Uh, something scientific, something or other. And um, a very knowledgeable guy. And I think what he was going to try to do was update the investigative techniques and the database and all that stuff. And um, I did get to talk to him about that. And then it was a couple days, maybe a week later, uh, I saw this thing. He's also a friend on Facebook. I saw this thing where he resigned, and he gave his whole spiel of why, uh, and it was because of the uh, uh, ventry issue, and uh, he just didn't want to be associated with anything like that, and he felt as though uh, he was lied to, and he didn't even know. As a matter of fact, he thought that ventry was no longer with Mufon, but he said that ventry had called. I think called him to advise him that um, he was the guy taking care of the conferences. And that was it for him. He was done. Um, When that stuff was going on with Ventry, I really didn't even get involved in it. I I read a couple things. I thought, like, well, you know, this will go wherever it goes, and that's the end of it. But um, he just seemed like he felt like he was betrayed. Um. And, uh, I, you know, I don't know where Ventry is in MUFON or what he's doing, if he's still there or, or if he's just, you know, in the shadows someplace. I, I don't get involved with bigger groups because I don't really get anything out of a bigger group. I get more out of a, uh, let's put it this way, I'll get more out of calling a Jody Cook or a Stanton Friedman or, um, you know, somebody else um, involved in, in whatever I'm looking at than I will get from a big group. And there are some big groups out there. I mean, MUFON is the biggest, but, um, you know, they are what they are. And uh, I just I just don't get involved with them. I, I don't really need to. Um, uh, so whatever happens with them happens. I know uh, it's a, I, I know, I know it's a sticky it was point a mess. for you. Oh, it was, a, it was a mess. It was a mess. And I just thought this just better to just back up and stay there. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I know it's a sticky situation for you because you were involved in Pennsylvania MUFON where John Ventry was a state director. And I think MUFON, for the most part, they have 4,000 members. I don't think they're all lackeys or they're all bad bad people. No, no means, no. You know, I I know, I know. I know a lot of these researchers in MUFON. I've known them for years, many years, some of them. And they are good uh, people. Uh, they are good researchers. They're good investigators. They do what they're supposed to do. They do their job. And I don't care what group it is. You're going to have, uh, you know, a bad apple here and there. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, they eventually get weeded out. Unfortunately, uh, with the onset of the Internet, you know, one little statement uh, is now a big deal. Um, I 
like the people I deal with in MUFON. Uh, some of the people that are involved with my groups are involved with MUFON. They are MUFON members. Uh, I have no issues with MUFON. Uh, I promote them when I have to or, you know, when I can, uh, when they're doing something locally. But, um, you know, it's, it's always been that way. It's been that way in the paranormal field. It's been that way in the UFO field. It's been... It's just crazy. I mean, it's this... this um, I'm not going to use the word backstabbing. I'm going to use the word drama. If there's no drama, it ain't right. you got to get drama in there. There's got to be some kind of drama. I don't like this guy. This guy, I don't like this guy. This guy's a jerk. This guy, don't do this. This guy does that. I get more reports. Than this. They just go on and on and on and on and on. And evidently they enjoy that <laughs> because they do it all the time. Uh, I don't get involved in the drama. It's just crazy. It's not worth it. It's a waste of time, effort, and energy. And um, I don't know what Cogsworth is going to, uh, Cogswell is going to do. Um, uh, like I said, I've been off of off of Facebook now for uh, almost three weeks because of the illness. And um, so I'll see if I, if he gets a hold of me. But uh, it, it's it's strange because, like I said, there are so many good researchers out there that aren't known to people. They really aren't. Uh, they may be known to me or my people or people that are involved, you know, in a certain uh, genre, but they're just not known to the public, and they like it that way because they don't want to get out there and get involved in all that melee crap. And it's not just move on. It, it happens with every group. I mean, um, hell, I know one paranormal group. They changed their name five times already since I know them. Five times. So... After somebody gets, you know, off on somebody else, they pack it in, they start a new group, they get new hats, new T-shirts made up, new business cards, they change the name, they get a new website, and that lasts a year, and then it happens all over again, and new hats and new T-shirts, so the hats and T-shirts guys are making a fortune. Uh, it's just, I, I always tell people when, they, you know, if they, if they get the feeling that, you know, there's uh, some kind of drama involved in a group that they may be interested in, or they're looking at to join or something like that, I, just, I don't tell them all the same thing. Back away. Just don't get involved. Why, why would you uh, want to get involved in drama that you don't even know anything about? And it's not going to help you in your investigation. It's just going to hamper you because you're not going to be doing your investigation. You'll be worried about who said what about who. And, um, and it works for us, so. And I can see that, but is it just because all of this drama comes out because MUFON is at the top of the pedestal when it comes to these investigations, name brand wise, Butch? I'm not saying investigation wise, I'm saying name brand wise, because they do have some good people in there. We've had a number of MUFON people on this show, and they have been fantastic, very helpful, very accommodating. At some point, I think most of them have been very truthful and open with their investigations. But let's face it, it only takes a couple of bad apples to ruin it for everybody. And is that what we're seeing right now? Because it just seems like every time MUFON tries to take a couple steps forward, there's another incident that just kind of brings it all back and everybody's saying, oh, there goes MUFON again. Well, look. MUFON's bad raps go back many years, uh, and it's and a lot of it was nonsense. Um, you know, uh, maybe uh, they had a speaker at one of their conferences that was a little over the edge, or somebody didn't agree with uh, something that was said or written about in their periodical. Uh, it's always a little. It's always a little something that gets blown out into a big thing. Or you have uh, somebody gets promoted that everybody thinks is a loser or they don't like them uh, or they don't particularly care for the guys in this particular, you know, this, uh, maybe they don't like Southern California or they don't like upstate New York or they don't like Pennsylvania or they don't like Florida, you know, so automatically they don't like MUFON. Um, like I said, the people I know on MUFON that I've dealt with in the past and I do deal with now, including some members of the, their board, they're very good people. They're not uh, dumb by any means. They know what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. But like any other group, 
any other big group, they have constraints. You know, they have to follow rules and regulations. Uh, we don't have any rules and regulations. I tell my guys and my girls, do what you got to do to get the information. You know, whatever it is, dig as far as you can dig. Where with big groups, you can't do that. You, you know, make a, um, a basic report. You may follow up or you may send it to somebody else in your group or in that group to follow up with, whether it be uh, somebody to look at photographs or to um, maybe do a site check or something like that. But that's as far as it goes. Um, you don't get an answer. There's no end to it. And, that, and that's the reason I left. I mean, I wasn't getting an end to what I was looking at. And now with this, the way I have, well, the way the group is set up now, I can uh, start something, look into something, and I have cases that are going on now for six years, and we still get good information. And now, if I was probably in a bigger group, that information would have been done like two or three weeks into the investigation. Somebody would have wrote it off and said, that's it, we're done. But um, I find when you stay with investigations, and I don't care what it is, Bigfoot or canines or uh, paranormal or ufology, I mean, you need to stick with it. I mean, you've got to come to a point with uh, anything that you're doing investigation-wise or research-wise where you know that it's at that point where, okay, there is no more. And you have to be able to accept that. Uh, and that works the opposite way, too, where you've been working on something for two or three years and you're just ready to close the book on it and something else pops up. Now, whether it's a, maybe something came into investigation or maybe somebody contacted you or you got some little, somebody sent you something or a photograph arrived and then it's all over. You're, you know, you're starting from day one again. And that's the part that I like. I mean, that's the fun part when you get something new after being like dead in the water for a little while and you're like, eh, I don't know about that. And then all of a sudden you get something and go like, whoa, we're off and running. So that's, that's the neat part of it. But, you know, big groups, I mean, people had with, and I, I move on, uh, you know, they had problems when Bigelow was involved. Uh, they had problems with directors, you know, national directors, they were in, they were out, you know, it seemed like they had a new one every two years or something like that. But, and whatever the deal is with, I don't know what the deal is with Ventry. I don't, I, like I said, I don't get involved. I don't know what he's doing, where he's at, what, what's happening, nor, nor do I care. I mean, it has nothing to do with me or my group. So whatever they do, they do. You know, one of the things that I look at this is, and I was talking to Cogswell today about it, and he said, you know, one of the disappointing things for him was there were a lot of people who were sharing his concerns internally, and I I don't know if there was conversation saying, well, if you quit, I quit. You know how people talk like that. But he was quite disappointed in a lot of the people who he, I guess he talked to who are still there. You know, yeah. they're ta everybody's talking behind everyone's back there, it seems, and yeah. everybody's saying, oh, I'm going to quit, I'm going to quit. And when somebody like Cogswell, who takes a stand against some of this stuff, actually does something about it, you know, because it is volunteer time, you expect them to reciprocate. And he was quite disappointed and actually a little bit flabbergasted that nobody kind of walked out the door with him. Does that surprise yeah. you? No, it doesn't surprise me at all. Um, people get to that point where they're breaking bad and, uh, you know, this is this and this is that and I'm not going to be here, I'm quitting, I'm going to do this, that and the other thing and next thing you know, they're a state director somewhere. <laughs> so... Um, look, they've lost a lot of good people over the years. There's no doubt about that. I mean, they would admit that. Uh, but like I said, there is still a lot of good people there. And they're doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, what they do with the information they turn over to MUFON is really out of their control. Now, whether MUFON lets them continue with it or files it away in a, in a box somewhere, that's really up to move on. I mean, it's, it's an organization. But you hit it right on the head. It's a volunteer organization. 
Now, I know you have to pay to become an investigator and you have to pay to do this and pay dues and pay this and pay that, but you're still a volunteer. One of the things that always cracked me up was when they would fire somebody, I'm thinking like, how the hell do you fire a volunteer? If the guy's a volunteer and you're not paying him, how do you fire him? But it has happened. Well, I mean, you could say the same thing of why didn't they, you know, maybe that's the reason why they never fired Ventry after his racist remarks. I realize you don't, I, I realize you don't like going down that road, but <coughs> there is, no, it's possible. there is that possibility. Sure. Yeah. But, um, I don't know. I, uh, you know, whatever he did, he did, um, uh, I mean, uh, I just saw where Joe Rook put in there about James Clarkson. Uh, James left MUFON years ago, and then he went back. And then, you know, uh, more stuff started, and he left again. Now he's out altogether. I believe he has his own group now. I'm pretty sure he does, has his own group. Um, there were a lot of good investigators that have quit over the years, I mean, that I'm aware of. Um, and they're either out on their own or they have a small group, maybe four or five people that they, they work with. And then I know some that have quit and have gone back. Why? You know, it's up to them why they went back. But it's, it's very hard to judge uh, what's going on in a group when you're not involved in it. I mean, when I was involved as a chief investigator, star team member, I knew everything was going on. I mean, all that stuff came across my desk. But... And since I've left, I mean, I I don't know squat. I mean, only what I hear or what people uh, ask me about or talk about. But, um, yeah, they've lost some really good people over time. They really have. Uh, but everybody moves on and does their own thing. How do you clean it up? Is it possible? Like, could they get a, let's say Jan Harzen stepped down tomorrow. Could the next person coming in there clean it up? And if so, how would he do it, Butch? <clears throat> Never going to happen. No. Uh, Move on is set in their ways and their and the way they do things and how they do it. It hasn't changed. It's not going to change. Um, we've had uh, how many directors since I'm there? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Five directors since I was in there and left. So it hasn't changed in five directors. So I just don't think it's ever going to change. It'll be what it is. You answer to the board. The board is the the board is the bottom line. So whatever the rank and file, and that would be in any group. I don't care what it is. It be, be, could be on a baseball team. Whatever the rank and file wants, they still got to go to the guy that owns a team. If the guy that owns a team doesn't want to do it, it's not going to happen. So it, it's a, that's a very strange situation there because – I've seen some of the reasons why people left, and I just went like, eh, that was dumb, <laughs> you know. And then I've seen some people leave uh, only because they challenged the board of directors, and they got nowhere. And they just said, okay, screw it, we're out of here. Is there a way that a secondary group of that nature could be started or is there too many independent groups out there and everybody's more interested in doing their own thing now? I think there's just too many independents. Not just groups, but independent researchers on their own. Um, I mean, and they've been there a long time. Um, oh, okay, I'll just take Jody, because you just had Jody on a little while ago. Uh, take Jody Cook. I mean, he's been involved since the 90s. So he's been around a long time. Uh, Stan Friedman, he just retired. He's been around forever. Uh, you know, uh, there are people that have been around a long time that although they spoke at a lot of MUFON uh, things and stuff like that, they that's as far as it went. I mean, they weren't members of MUFON. They did the conferences and, you know, they did the, the thing, they, you know, like they put... Um, uh, maybe a report or two in the journal, but you know that's the extent of their MUFON connection. Um, the real workhorses out there are the field investigators. Those are the guys and girls that are out there doing their job. And if it wouldn't be for them, I mean, if they didn't exist, MUFON wouldn't exist. So, 
so for people then, Butch, who are out there in the mainstream and they have a UFO sighting, the first place they're going to look is the internet. Who do I report mm-hmm. this to? Where can I go? Or somebody's going to say, oh, you should report it to MUFON. Do you think then that they get an unfair advantage on the amount of cases that they are working on because of the name recognition? Uh, yeah, I would say yes. But uh, that also works both ways. If they had a good experience with MUFON, of course they'll go back. If they've had a bad experience with MUFON, maybe the researcher didn't show up or or the guy or whatever was just a jerk, you know. Uh, and, you know, it, it erodes their trust in MUFON. MUFON's had a fair share of that, but they've also, they get the, the, the majority of the calls because it is MUFON. It's, it's very well advertised. It's been around for a long time, and people know it. People remember the name. And um, but it doesn't stop other groups from getting reports. Uh, like we get reports, and we're not we're not anywhere near move on size. Um, but uh, I I think they'll always be there. It would really take some kind of really catastrophic thing to happen in MUFON for them to fold. Uh, I've heard people say, "Oh, they're going to fold next year." They're going to, or something happens. They lose a director. Oh, they're going to fold now. You know, well, no, they got another director in there the next day. So um, I I know some of their um, conferences do well, and some don't. It depends on who they have up there speaking and what they're talking about. I mean, if you if MUFON would have somebody come up and talk about the moon being made out of green cheese, half the people in that room would walk out. But now if they have somebody coming in and talking about, uh, you know, um, sightings or a new type of study being done or something like that, they'll stay and listen. So MUFON's uh, 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 an enigma. <clears throat> they have, um, I, I believe it's 3,500 members now. The last time I heard a number, it was 3,500 members. But they're in other countries also, so that's just not 3,500 in the United States. I mean, they have people in Canada, they have people in uh, in South America, they have people in Japan, they have people everywhere. So I, I don't know what the true number is in the United States. I would probably think here in the States it might be around 2,000, somewhere around there, and the rest of that number would probably be scattered around the globe. But, um, I mean, they have the right people in the right places, and sometimes I, you know, I, I read some of their stuff. I'm going like, I just don't understand why this isn't working, <laughs> you know. Um, or, or, or they'll have, um, in one recent thing, one of their top-notch people just packed it in, and said, "Screw it, I'm done." Three days later, he's back. So I don't know what that was all about, but don't really care either. It's just, it's a big group, and you know, when it, you have anything big, like you can handle what you got on your radio. Right, it's you. Yes, it's yes. you and your you and your guests. Now, if there were five of you and twenty guests in a four-hour period or a three-hour period, it'd be like watching a monkey trying to have intercourse with a football. It would just be a, a, a disaster. And sometimes I think with with these bigger groups or groups not quite as big as Move On, but close to it, they get so involved that they're just stepping all over each other. And um, and then, you know, it just it goes to hell in the handbasket. And there's nothing you can do about it. But I think, I don't, I, I hear it pretty much all the time where people, oh, they'll fold next year. And, you know, I've been hearing that since I was a member. But, um, all right, look, it is what it is, just like anything else. Uh, you'll have issues pop up and... Um, now Harzen, I don't, I don't know Harzen that well. Uh, only a couple things that uh, I've read that he, he put out and wrote, or you know, stuff that he spoke about. Uh, I know he's been with Mufon for a long time. Um, he's probably been l- not quite the longest director they've had, but in recent history he is. And you know, it seems like when I read something, it seems like he's truly trying to get something done for the betterment. And then next thing you know, he's, he'll say something stupid, and everybody will go after him, and then that all falls apart. 
the way it is. It just happens. Let's move on to here, my friend. Question from Joe in the chat room. Butch, you like to use your flur. What's the last thing that's pretty cool that you caught on it? Uh, my uh, Well, we have a number of flurs now. We started out with one. Now we got four, I think. Four, yeah. Uh, I think one of the neatest things that I caught on the flur uh, was... Uh, the image of this whatever it is down at the farm up on the roof and on the ground I mean it's still there Uh, now it has moved Uh, shape hasn't changed much when I look at one photo to another or if I look at one video to another they're pretty much the same the the, uh, temperature even though the temperature now around here is in the 60s high 60s uh, when I was down two, three, four weeks ago um uh, the temperature of these things is still 25, and the outside temperature was at that point 58. So, whatever they are, they are. I don't know. I'm just going to keep photographing and videoing um, until I can come up with something. And um, that was one. Uh, uh, that case is one, and the other case with Fleur is. Um, a gentleman uh, who lives in, uh, that would be southern Lancaster County, he kept hearing movement behind the house. And um, his description, of course, was sort of bipedalish, but it really wasn't. And I went down and I set up two flurs, uh, one on video and one that I was holding in my hand. I could use video or camera with that. And when I was watching, I heard the noise. I could hear the noise as plain as day, like something was just stomping around the woods. And lo and behold, in southern Lancaster County, two koi wolf. There they were, plain as day. That's odd. Now, we have coyotes around here, but not koi wolf. Koi wolf will find northern Pennsylvania. But to find them in southern Pennsylvania, wow, that was something. What but he about, sleeps better. What about paranormally? What have you caught that is just phenomenal on a flur? Nothing on paranormal. Um, nothing at all. I, I do very little paranormal. Um, I would like to do more, but I really don't get those cases. They go to, you know, to the Ghostbusters, I guess. I uh, I seem to be stuck in this realm of uh, cryptozoology, u- ufology and cryptozoology. Although we do get abduction cases, and we do get uh, an occasional paranormal, but nothing that I've caught on Fleur at all. UFOs, cryptids? Uh, a lot of stuff with the cryptids is stuff that we hear, but we can't see until we get a Fleur up, and then we can tell what it is. That is my biggest thing with the bipedal canines. I want to get one on a flur. I don't care if he's standing still, standing on his head, doing the Irish jig, or whatever he's doing, or taking a leak. But I want him on that flur. Because once I have him on the flur, I can gauge his size. Um, I can gauge his pretty much his weight. I can gauge his uh, what he looks like. I can change. Uh, I can do a lot with a flur as far as bringing that image to... Um, something that is recognizable as it is, whatever it is. Let's move on here, because in the next hour, we're going to talk quite a bit about these so-called dogman soldiers that a lot of people have all of a sudden started talking about. And it's weird because... I'd never heard of them until Jody Cook was on about a month ago to talk to him. But let's talk about the bipedal canines here for a minute. Have you, or how close, Butch, have you ever been to one of these bipedal reports? Let's say, have you been out in the field working around and all of a sudden a call comes in, bipedal canine, can you rush over here? What's the closest you've got to a a report as soon as it's come in? Uh, about nine hours. And um, 
it was the one, two, three. It was the fourth report that we got, and um, he got the report. Uh, a guy gave me his phone number. I called him right away. He gave me the exact location. Um, that was around one o'clock in the morning. We left at four thirty. I picked up two of my investigators and off we went. And um, uh, we met him at a restaurant. He took us to the exact location in daylight because it was still dark. And uh, we stayed two days. It was weird. And when I say weird, it was like you kind of had this feeling like something happened, but you didn't know what it was or what happened, really. Only what he told you happened. And when we, you know, kind of looked the area over and and deployed flurs and security cameras and all that kind of stuff. Um, it was like nothing ever happened. But when we first got there, uh, it was something happened. I mean, you could feel it in the air. It was, it, it's, it's bizarre when you talk like that because people think, oh, this guy's really nuts. But you, you kind of get this feeling like something was there. It, you, you, you know it's there. You just don't know where it is. And when you start scanning around and looking at, you know, this, that, and the other thing, um, it's, it's just a feeling that you have that, yeah, something was here, but it's not here now. But it was here. And, I mean, it's, it's very strong in your head, like, it was here. But now, what is it? And... Um, it's it's just crazy. I mean, that was the closest that we came um, to getting there really quick. Uh, we went down. We took a. Uh, we left at. Uh, we got a report at ten o'clock at night. We left at midnight and headed for Virginia, Northern Virginia, uh, which took us down into the Appalachians. And um, it was a uh, mummified foot that was found on a property and although we from the photographs kind of determined that it was um, a bear a large barefoot we didn't know until we actually saw it and then we actually saw it then we knew what it was but if we get a report and it's you know something that's going on now or has happened in the last few hours or even the last 24 hours I want to roll on it. I don't want to just talk about it. I want to go see. I want to see what it is and if it means anything or, you know, even if it's a footprint. Um, it, it, it's it's the only way to get an answer quickly. Um, now, we've had impressions found at the site of bipedal reports, but they're impressions. They're not a footprint. So, you know, anything can make an impression. Um, we have um, thought about, and I'm pretty sure we're going to go through with it, because some of the areas that we have had these sightings in, although they're heavily wooded, there are some areas that are, you know, just open fields where they've been seen on the tree line and stuff. And I, I think we're going to deploy a drone um, so right now we're just kind of looking at what kind to get and, you know, how much it's going to cost. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really weird. You know, I've been on UFO cases where, you know, I went like, oh, it looks like an airplane to me. And then, you know, I get a good pair of binoculars up and go like, oh, that ain't no airplane. Uh, so, you know, you know, you never know what you're going to get when you get there. Um but on-site investigation is still the best, in my opinion. It's If you can do an on-site investigation, and it doesn't have to be, I'm not saying within 24 hours, but quickly, you know, where there's not a lot of weather uh, or inclement weather that has taken possible evidence away, uh, it is, um, it's still the best way to do it. Uh, talking to that person up front, looking them in the eye when they're telling you the story, um, visiting the site, um, looking at what, you know, they're telling you this is where it was or this is what I saw. That to me is, that's that's good, just good investigative work. It's good forensic work. But um, 
look, we've run out on some bummers already where, you know, we got there and went like, ain't no way this happened. You know, <laughs> you kind of feel a little foolish. So, you know, you pack up your gear and get in the truck and go to a diner and have breakfast. we got about two minutes here before we got to go to break once again as another hour has flown by with you, Butch. With these bipedal canines, there is a difference between, in your, at least in your opinion, between these creatures and the dogman. What is the difference between the two in your opinion? Well, uh, the, the, the biggest difference is the descriptions. Uh, the descriptions of the dogman... Uh, they're all over the place. I mean, they're seen on all fours. They have fluffy tails, fluffy coats, multicolored coats, floppy ears. Uh, they got a nose, you know, or a snout like a dog. Um, they don't look anything like a wolf. The size is wrong when they're on their hind legs for a little bit. Uh, they're basically, uh, you know, between four and a half and five and a half foot tall. Um, they they're, they run away when they're confronted. You know they'll take off. And with the bipedal, you have a creature that in every report is described exactly the same: eight to ten foot tall, large wolf head, short pointed ears, glowing yellow eyes, massive chest, thin waisted, heavy thighed, uh, hocked legs like a dog, long arms with hands and claws, and standing upright. Never seen on all fours. Never. Not one report puts them on all fours. They're always standing upright. Um, they show no fear. They stand their ground. Everybody that's encountered them, whether with a weapon or without a weapon, has the same feeling uh, in their head to get out of Dodge or something really bad is going to happen here really quick. And um, even professionals that have run into these things, like uh, the um, one gentleman who's a, actually a park ranger who was carrying a weapon, uh, and encountered one, uh, all he wanted to do was get out of there. Now, he had plenty of ammunition and plenty of wherewithal to knock it down if he wanted to, but he just said it just it was in his head not to do that. Get out of here. Leave. Same thing with a hunter in a tree stand who had one within his sights with a high-powered 30 out 6 rifle within 100 yards and actually got down to around 25 yards where it was at the base of the tree growling at him. So... Uh, that's the difference. You have all these things on the bipedal canine side and then the dog man side, uh, which um, the descriptions are so varied. Almost every report, it's a different description. Right. With the bipedal here in our like and loop that we call it, the reports are exactly the same. And they're all over like a seven or eight county area with very heavy woods. And we don't have any outside that area. On that note, Butch, I got, I, I got to get you to hold on. We got to hop out for our final break of the night. I do apologize because we always lose track of time when Butch Witkowski is here. Strange days with Butch happens the final Monday of every month. One more hour to go with Butch Witkowski from UFO Comp on Spaced Out Radio. Are you tired of being blocked, shadow banned, or placed in jail for simply posting your thoughts on social media? Social Media Freedom can take care of that for you. Social Media Freedom is the newest and one of the best free new apps that allows you the freedom to post what you want, when you want. It takes seconds to download from your app store. Come join the tribe at Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. The first annual Caribou Paracon is happening September 28th to 30th in the 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia. Brought to you by the Canadian Society of Questers and Spaced Out Radio. Come listen to our featured speaker, Grant Cameron, along with Elizabeth Anglin, Paisley Town, Mike Morin, Eric Cooper, and more. It's a three-day supernatural adventure at the Spruce Hills Resort and Spa. Tickets for the weekend are $150 Canadian. The Caribou Paracon, celebrating everything paranormal. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. 
SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. We're lighting the void on Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio. Hey, this is Joe Roop, and I'm hanging out in SOR headquarters every Saturday night, bringing you the latest news when it comes to the weird and strange. Bigfoot, occult, UFOs, ghosts, and everything in between, I got you covered. You can tune in to spacedoutradio.com starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time. Come travel into the void with us on Spaced Out Saturdays. Not ready for bed on Saturday night? Right after Spaced Out Saturdays, hop on over to S4 with Corey Ruiz and me, Eric Cooper from Forest Moon Paranormal. With S4, there are no limits to what we try and uncover. From government conspiracies to helping clean up the paranormal, no topic is safe on S4. We get to the heart of the matter, of the subjects you want to learn more about. So tune in on S4 starting at midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern, only on SpacedOutRadio.com. There's stories, then there's the truth. Do any of us really trust the news anymore? This is Jamie Sexton, owner of Rebel Planet News. The third Thursday of every month, I appear on spacedoutradio.com to bring you the truth you deserve without mainstream media lies or alternative media fear mongering. We'll get to the heart of the story and deliver the truth you're seeking. So come join us here for the Rebel Planet at spacedoutradio.com. The Call of the Wild is in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is one of the hottest bars and restaurants in the city. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose will rock you like a hurricane all night long. Great food with everything on the menu at $6.95. Near the corner of Nelson and Granville, get your horns up and come rock with us. The Moose Vancouver, the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. This is Eric Markham, news editor for the Spaced Out Radio's The Encounter Online. We have put together a great team of writers and journalists from all over the world to bring you top quality paranormal stories, from alien encounters to the latest conspiracies. You won't find any of that fake news here. True stories and top notch reporting as we look to bring these experiences to the mainstream. The Encounter Online, only at spacedoutradio.com. Do you want to know the truth? Do UFOs exist? Are aliens real? Are the governments hiding the biggest secret in history? We're UFO seekers, and we're on a hunt for the truth. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow along with us as we journey across the United States, visiting UFO hotspots and alien hotspots, trying to document the UFO phenomenon. Catch us on Spaced Out Radio every third Monday of the month as we discuss Area 51, UFOs, and more. And also, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. It's Cosmic Sundays with me, Elizabeth Anglin, in Cosmic Passport. Let me take you down a three-hour spiritual journey where we will get into everything from ET contact to Psychic Sundays. It's a journey of listening and learning together with some of the best professionals in their fields. You can tune in to Cosmic Passport at spacedoutradio.com every Sunday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, 
its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and hashtag Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Great to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the program, Geraldine Orozco joins us. We are going to be talking the spiritual you. It happens the first Tuesday of every month where we try and find our zen and our chi. We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. We want to welcome in everyone listening in on WQEE 99 Rock the Key down in Noonan, Georgia, home of the Walking Dead. We are live as well at the United Public Radio Network 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. We are also live at spacedoutradio.com Spreaker and you can catch us live on the Fringe FM. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. I wish it was syrup, but it isn't. Bill makes his own maple syrup up there in Ontario. Cressmomancy Cressmomancy is your password for tonight. Bill sets a password each and every night right here on the mighty S-O-R. And hit him up for some syrup, too, because he needs it. It's good syrup, too. Not going to lie. Now, if you want to follow us on social media, we are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can watch us live Monday through Friday night on Periscope.tv. And if you want to check out our archives, they are free on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio. So go to YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Our website, SpacedOutRadio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to some Bubblefoot, shop at our Spaced Out Radio store, read the encounter online, or watch great videos from UFO Seekers, Contact TV, and so much more. For the final time tonight, we introduce Butch Witkowski from UFO Comp. Butch joins us the final Monday of every month with a little feature we call here Strange Days. Butch, welcome back. Thank you, sir. Now, Butch, a couple months ago, or about a month and a half ago, we had Jody Cook on from Ohio, where he told an incredible story of running into a fellow U.S. Army veteran who, after a beer or two, started telling him about this spec ops team he was involved with on Delta Force. And one of their missions was to hunt down aliens. And one day they got a call about these strange dogman-like creatures standing about seven to eight feet tall down in Brazil. And they had to go take care of these creatures. Now, Jody called me last week, and I'm not going to get into f- too much detail about them because Jody is coming back on to tell these stories. But one of the big things that he mentioned was after saying that report, he had a number of veterans reach out to him about these reports happening in Afghanistan as well. Now, are you believing that there is some sort of militaristic alien dogman force that is on Earth here, or are we just barking up the wrong tree, pun intended? Very good pun. Um, I would really need to see the evidence, not just something word of mouth. Um, you know, when the movie came out, Dog Soldiers, that was about a group of uh, which is amazing because it was similar to the movie The Mummy Returned. Uh, the creature was a very tall, very powerful wolf that encountered a group of Br- British uh, SAS officers, uh, military men, I, I, and they had them holed up in a house and a big battle going on. It was it was a really bloody, gory type of thing. The, the movie really never took off at, uh, that I can think of to the best of my knowledge, anyway. But um, these creatures have been used in other movies. And uh, although they, especially in the movie, the movie came out, I believe, May of 2001, which was the second film in the trilogy of The Mummy. It was called The Mummy Returns. And in the opening scene, it shows the army of Anubis, which is working under the auspices of the warrior Scorpion King, that's the opening battle scene. And um, they're seen with the battle axes 
uh, which were uh, in Egyptian times, the battle axe was actually two bladed axe with a, a very uh, heavy stick between them and two brass, uh, uh, bronze rather, uh, axe heads at the end. That was their main weapon. And then, um, and I have seen some things where they talked about uh, a type of sword used by these creatures um, that the military is supposed to be fighting. And they're describing what is uh, the Egyptian Kopesh, which was a sickle-like uh, sword that was developed after the battle axes. That was also made of bronze. And um, But when you look at a picture of Anubis, uh, which was the Egyptian god of the dead. It has the head and the body of a jackal. And um, very tall, uh, very muscular, hocked legs like a, like a, like a, a jackal would have, and um, just mean looking, mean as a snake. <laughs> but uh, it's funny that in both of those movies, uh, first one would be The Mummy Returns, where they were dominant in the first battle scene and the last battle scene and then in the uh, uh, the dog soldiers and it was almost the exact same creature only it was more of a wolf head than it was a uh, jackal head but the body shape and everything else was pretty much the same they were just a little bit larger and um, they weren't using anything but their hands and teeth I mean, you know, they weren't carrying any weapons but I, I would find it I, I just find it a little without evidence a picture or, or or you know a sworn testimony or something like that where you would have the it's just like the old story of military and bigfoot you know uh where bigfoot got injured and the military came in and got him out and took care of him and then turned him loose or uh where bigfoot was captured and they had a bunch of them uh down in maryland in an old prison building you know i mean the stories abound over time but um I, I just can't see, uh, what was the other one? Uh, that was, was that a Bigfoot where uh, special forces went out after Bigfoot and the one guy, they, they, they tore him in half and hung him up in a tree somewhere? And that wasn't too long ago. Um, so, uh, you know, wolves are very exotic. Everybody likes wolves. They're very nasty. They're mean looking. But when you see a picture of one in the wild, they're beautiful. And, um, you know, ever since, the, you know, from the very first time that, you know, back in uh, what was been the 40s, uh, right after, yeah, 47, 46, 47, when the first werewolf, Lon Chaney, you know, came on to the big screen, um, there's been this fascination with werewolves and with, you know, wolf monsters. Uh, and there have been many, many movies uh, over the years on, on werewolves. I, I just, I need a whole lot more information on the military involvement with this because, you know, why would our guys go down to Brazil, right, to chase some creatures around the woods when the Brazilians have a very, very tough outfit on their own that equals our special forces? No problem. So why wouldn't they do it? Why would our guys go do it? And uh, it just seems like, you know, it's a play on a story, a line that just gets carried into all of a sudden it's a report. But uh, like the use of a kapesh, I mean, that wasn't a very big weapon. It was only a kapesh was actually only about two foot three inches or two foot four inches in length. And they weren't very sharp. They were more of a, a whacking instrument than they were a cutting instrument because they were made out of bronze, so they didn't really hold an edge. And uh, it's, you know, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, somebody starts a story, and when you start listening to the story, you're, in your mind, if you saw those movies, you're looking at the same movie, you know? Uh, like the, uh, the army of, uh, of Anubis. I mean, when you look at Anubis, or a picture of Anubis on the movie... I mean, Anubis, like I said, was the guardian of the dead. And that was that was in Egyptian religion. He was not a warrior by any means. Uh, he was more of a protector of the dead. But uh, uh, and his shape or it was always the same. He, he had kind of like the 
lower body of a man from the chest down, but from the head up, he was definitely a jackal with this ornate headdress. I, I don't know where to go with that. I, I wouldn't really need to uh, hear a lot more about it and, um, you know, do a little research on it to see, you know, where that where that story is coming up from. But like I said, I just don't see our military sending people down to Brazil when Brazilians have an extremely very fast and tactical and dangerous uh, group of gentlemen uh, in their special forces. So why would they need our guys? Well, I guess our guys, if I could use that term as a Canadian, ha- have the right gear to take these so-called creatures out. Now, apparently the Brazilians did go in in this story that Jody told. However, <clears throat> they lost a few men due to this because their weapons that they had were impenetrable, according hmm. according to the story. Now... I mean, it sounds so fake. I'm not going to lie. It sounds so fake. But this is something that is starting to gain a lot of traction. And Jody had a couple of recent veterans come up and say, no, we saw them in Afghanistan. This is hmm. this is absolutely terrible in the mount, a mountain's amount of uh, Afghanistan. And... I'm just wondering, you know, is it the movie or is it not? Now, Jody held back some information from me on this, Butch, and he's not going to be telling me until he comes on the air with that. And this was a real confirmation for him, and that's as far as he went. I'm stuck until he's on the air in July with us. But I'm wondering... If, if there are these these so-called dogman kill squads that go around taking out these dogman-like creatures when people are reported, maybe that's why we're not hearing as many reports about dogman as we are about Bigfoot. Hmm. Yeah, it is. It's a little um, bizarre. Uh, and like I said, I don't, I don't really know a whole lot of the information on the, on these, on these couple things. All, all I, I do know is like, you know, when I've heard some or read some descriptions of the type of weapon that they would carry, which was a kapesh, that's an Egyptian weapon. Nobody else ever made a weapon like that. Only the Egyptians. And, um, uh, their description was almost dead center on with the army of Anubis in that movie. And um, in the other movie, which was called Dog Dog Soldiers, um, they didn't describe them as wolves. They were described as large dogs, and only toward about the middle or closer to the end that they started describing them as a wolf. But um, the the movie Dog Soldiers, it was just a bloody mess. I mean, it was just, you know, throat ripping and dismembering and all that kind of stuff. But they were fighting them with regular weapons. I mean, you know, I mean, everything that I saw that I watched, I mean, it was just, those those are the weapons are available to anybody in this country. You can buy them. Um, I don't mean the full automatic. Well, if you have a license, you can get the full automatic. But it was, uh, it's interesting. It's, it's an interesting theory. Um, like I said, you know, the military evidently has been involved in abductions uh, in England where um, they say that the, the um, um, what do they call them, the, uh, the Euro, um, have their own teams to go out and check out human abductions when bodies are found or mutilations. Um, that, that's, that's a long story. That's, that's been going on for five or six years, that story, and there have been a number of witnesses that came forward on that where they said that these special teams that were mostly American, not all, but mostly, would go to the scene where there was a, a, a mutilation of a human being and clean it up. Um, then there are, uh, again, there are stories of, uh, of where the military, our military, um, not so much special forces as just um, uh, going out and trying to... Um, you know, aid these creatures when they're in trouble. And then there's the one story, I believe it was Navy SEALs, 
that were out after a couple of these things that were just going wild and killing people and one of their guys got ripped in half and hung up in a tree and uh, there was a firefight you know it just goes on and on and on so you know trying to separate fact from fiction is a real chore because you know you don't get to uh really listen or talk to the witnesses um and then when you do hear the story and if you saw those movies i mean the story almost matches the movie in description weapons uh locations you know what i mean and that's that's tough to separate unless you really got some flat out information or you know you got signed witness statements or you came upon uh, maybe a military record uh, through the government where such an, a, a team does exist, which I find that hardly to find. Um, it's just like Dan just said, sounds like a scene from Predator. But um, you have um, an abundance of these stories over the years. Now, these uh, what you're talking about, what Jody's talking about with witnesses coming forward, that's the first I've heard of those. Uh, but the uh, description, especially after that movie, um, Dog Soldiers came out, there were all kind of stories flying around. But they are all generated by the movie. So once again, like with everything else, you know, if, if a movie comes out and it's uh, interesting enough and gory enough and plausible enough that it could happen. All of a sudden, it becomes a report. So, do you think and a lot? Do you think a lot of these butch then are focused more on what the movies are? Because we saw an influx of people saying they'd been taken by aliens after fire in the sky. After the movie Signs, people were noticing crop circles all over the place. People saying that Megalodon is real after Jaws came out. There, there's yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right on the money. And, and it always happens like that. I mean, uh, like I said earlier uh, in the show, where when Independence Day came out, UFO reports skyrocketed. I mean, all over the world, not just in the States. I mean, just like in the movie where these uh, craft huddled over different countries, that's what people were reporting that large craft were seen in the desert, the large craft were seen over London, large craft were seen over Germany, large craft were seen over this, that, and everything. And it was right after the movie. And then it all just died down and went away. Now, if there's really good evidence that some kind of SWAT team, military SWAT team, is out there, you know, fighting it off with some type of a creature, I would think that there would be something that would come up where there would be um, information or paperwork or, you know, maybe somebody from that country says that, well, you know, these guys from America came in here and they were whooping ass. Something has to come up. But um, I, I'm skeptical because it, it's just, there's too many things that I've read where it matches two movies almost to the T. Um, so, we'll see. I'll listen and see what Jody has to say. Is it the copycat syndrome then? You believe that it is, Butch? It could be, yeah. Oh, yeah. That happens a lot. That happens a lot. Um, when the movie Freddy came out, you know, Freddy with the razor fingers... Um, paranormal people were getting all kind of calls that they saw something that looked like Freddy Krueger walking through the cemetery. They had these long, razor-sharp fingers, you know. Uh, so, you know, it. it I, I don't know what causes that. It's probably a mind thing where, you know, people just, they watch something or they read something and all of a sudden it's it's real. You know, it's real life. Unfortunately, it's on a sound set somewhere. I, I, I don't know. I just it's uh, it'll be an interesting uh, listen. I you know I want to listen to see what he has to say. But there are a lot of questions, and I'm sure he's asking them. I mean, he's he's been around a long time. He knows what to ask. Um. Uh. So 
I guess we'll see. When it comes to these creatures, though, when you have military people sighting these creatures, even though they may not have given full-on reports, because, let's face it, when it comes to strange and weird, telling your military superiors about it can get you in more hot water than just ignoring the situation altogether and saying nothing happened. I mean, you know that, being a police officer. Do you put any well, stock into the fact that there are military people or even former military people saying, look, I saw this, this is real? Oh, yeah, no, no, look, uh, these guys are some of the best witnesses out there. Uh, when I was at a, I was speaking at a conference in Kansas, and uh, a sergeant, uh, actually, uh, a, uh, he was still in the military, a sergeant, who related a story where he was in a tank unit, and four of the tanks were parked out in the desert. You know, they, they were right outside of, I forget what city it was. <clears throat> they had already made their attack, and they were backed up now, and they were replenishing, eating, sleeping, you know, doing what they do, taking care of equipment. And uh, a couple of the guys were just laid out across the top of the tank because, you know, it's, it gets cold uh, at night in the desert, and um, uh, the tanks were running, so they you know, kind of taken the warmth from the engine and inside the tank. But just laying there, when uh, they watched a light, which they thought was actually a helicopter coming toward them, to the point where they snapped to and, you know, they got their guns ready to fight whatever was coming, and this bright light hovered above these four tanks, and um, it stayed there for quite a while. Uh, they called other tank units that were close by to see if this thing could be seen from their location to where they were, and they saw nothing. <clears throat> so that would probably be the end of the story right there. But one guy took a picture, and there it is, a white with a kind of reddish tint globe, orb, about 1,000 feet above the tank or that group of tanks, four tanks. So he said he reported it uh, the next morning uh, to his commanding officer, and his commanding officer said, you didn't see nothing. End of story. But he was brave enough to stand up in front of a couple hundred people at that conference and tell that story. So I guess there's guys out there that, you know, uh, damn the rules and regulations if they want to get something out they're going to get it out and that may be the case with Jody's two guys you know maybe they got blown off before and now they're just going to tell their story and they got somebody that'll listen and look into it well we'll definitely get more information on that because Jody wanted to save it for the audience so he's uh, teasing me with it so to speak so I'm very interested in looking at that but you mentioned you know, UFOs and that guy grabbing that picture. I know Eric Cooper from Forest Moon Paranormal, and I believe you've talked to Eric before. He actually said when he was serving in the first Gulf War, and he did four different tours of duty in four different countries, he was saying that you would see weird, strange, triangular objects all over the sky at night. Yeah. Not, not every day, not every day, but more often than not. And... His point was they didn't know what the hell they were, if it was our craft or if it was of an alien craft watching what was going on. He said some of them were just absolutely phenomenal in the mo moving and their maneuverability that they, were at, that they were accomplishing. So I guess when I look at it is like in a war zone where it is high stress, how can we take what a soldier says, Butch, verbatim when they are under such high stress levels emotionally physically mentally in a kill zone operation well i mean it's not like it's the first time these guys went to the dance i mean they know what to look for they know what they've got to do and they know when they got to do it so when something strange happens like a light in the sky or a craft 
I mean, you know, probably when they see something going across the sky, especially in a combat area, they're probably thinking, oh, okay, it's a, you know, it's an F-14 or F-16 or F-18, you know, going after somebody or whatever, or it's a helicopter gunship. But then when maneuvers change, you know, when the the uh, alt- attitude of the aircraft changes uh, or whatever it is, uh, starts making maneuvers that shouldn't be or stopping dead, uh, you know, like over those four tanks and staying there for quite a while, um, you know, I I tend to err on the side of their knowledge of their their environment that they're in. I mean, they're always at a, a heightened environment. They're always, uh, you know, they don't know who's going to be shooting at them in the next two minutes. Um, so uh, I take them with a little bit more credibility when they start describing something. And I did get to talk to that sergeant at the conference after he spoke. And very believable. I mean, you know, he said, I don't know what it was. Nobody knows what it was. He said, all I know is when I went to, repl- when I went to report it the next morning to my commanding officer, he just told me that I didn't see nothing. So... You know, when you have somebody saying that I saw this or this guy or a group of us saw this, and then you have somebody saying, like, you guys didn't see anything. I mean, that takes you back to um, the sightings of crafts that were over nuclear sites that shut down nuclear sites where they were told, you know, make your report, and that's as far as it goes. Shut up. So I I would take the word probably of... um, you know, a pilot or guys on the ground, they know what they're doing. They know what they're looking at. You know, they're just, they're probably even better observers than cops because, you know, they're doing, they're in that line of crap every day, every minute where, you know, hell, you could be in a police car and not write a ticket for six days or get a call, you know, that's worth anything. So it's, I, I, I would probably err on their side until I got more information to see what it was. Uh, but, I, I like you. I find it very hard to believe that, you know, there's a lot of countries out there that have forces, special forces that are equal to ours. No problem. No ifs, ands, or buts. I mean, Russian Spetsnaz troops. I mean, those guys are vicious. I mean, they don't take prisoners. And um, uh, I just don't see why Brazil would ask for some special unit to come down and clean these things out when they got all the weaponry they need. They got everything. Um, Their guys are just as well equipped as ours. So I guess we'll see when Jody tells us what's going on. I'm going to listen to it for sure. Now, the other question I have for you in regards to police officers, you being a former cop, was their roles or rules pertaining to, say, UFO sightings or Bigfoot sightings. What did you learn from that, and was it even worth filing a report? Uh, There was never anything while I was involved in anything like that, although uh, years after I ran into a gentleman that I knew when he was working and I was working uh, who told me about an, um, a pretty bad accident in a very bad intersection uh, in uh, Chester County where there were multiple fatalities. Uh, it's a, like a, uh, let's see, before, eight-lane highway that crosses over a four-lane highway, and it's just a stop sign. It's not even a red light. Well, it's a red light now, but back then it was just a stop sign. And evidently a truck ran the stop sign, you know, one car hit another, blah, blah. Before you know it, you had, I think there were six fatalities, uh, people in the cars dead, uh, a number of injured, uh, quite a few cars, uh, police cars on the scene. And all he related was, he said, I don't know what happened. He said there was a helicopter above, right? And it was their helicopter. It was a lifeline coming in. And um, he said, everything stopped. He said, just stopped, everything. He said, I can move my eyes and look around. And everybody was just kind of frozen in place. That was it, even the helicopter. It wasn't moving. He said, I looked up. Didn't have to move my head because I couldn't, but I could move my eyes. I looked up. He said, the blades weren't moving, but it was up in the air. And he said, you know, there were nine of us there, nine police officers on the scene of that crash. And he said, when we went to make our report, it was just like, if you want to wind up walking a beat up around the Erie Lake somewhere for the rest of your life, make the report. If you want to go on as things every day, as you are now, don't make the report. And nobody made the report. 
But that's the same thing as told the pilots. You know, a pilot can report a UFO if he's not in uniform. If a pilot is in uniform, whether military or civilian, and he gives a UFO report, he's done. He's finished. That's it. End of story. Go work at McDonald's. But isn't that, now cha- all- isn't that changing, though, because there are so many more pilots speaking out about this? Yeah, I mean, well, I, there were changes I, in FAA rules. FAA rules at one point was, you know, basically that. You can report what you want or you don't want to make a report. That's up to you. That's a career move. And then about, I think, three years ago, Dave, FAA changed their rules and any pilot wanting to make a UFO or unknown in the sky or uh, a close encounter of any type with a craft in the sky now makes that report to Bigelow Aerospace. Go figure. And I believe I sent you a copy of that. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. So in regards to getting back to the police for a section for a second, is it worth an officer's time to report in a UFO, even if multiple officers see it? Because, you know, we've heard those stories, Butch, where police officers are over the radios basically saying, are you checking out what's in the sky right now? Can you see anything? We've heard those reports. We've heard those tapes. So is that with every police department that guys get weary about that? Or is it you know, just certain ones maybe in smaller communities or bigger communities where they just don't want the headache? Well, uh, you know, there have been a number of chases recorded of UFOs by police officers. Uh, Some were multi-state, you know, where they started in one state and they went across two or three states chasing something. Those reports are very well documented. I mean, the radio reports, the written reports, that's that's all out there in the public. I think where you would have a problem would be in a small department, maybe a four- or six-man department. Um, uh, Say the guy got a call. He didn't see it, but he got a call to make a report. He would probably make an incident report of what was told to him, but he wouldn't say a yay or nay on anything. He would just make an incident report and turn it in. Now, if he saw it himself, by himself, without any uh, body around or no anything other than what he said, I would doubt very much he would even mention it. Is it the paperwork or just the ridicule and potential loss of a, of a career here? It would be the ridicule and possible loss of a career or, or promotion. What do you mean promotion? Uh, say the guy was a patrolman and he was up for corporal. And he's in there making a report or puts in a report that he saw a UFO and little green guys running around the middle of the highway. He will not make corporal. He will probably stay a patrolman the rest of his life or the rest of his career anyway. Right. Question coming in from Andrew on Twitter, if you don't mind, Butch. He's He's asking, Butch, there are more and more hints that the elite are attempting to map human consciousness in order to discover how this quality affects changes our 3D reality. Do you think consciousness is the key to your studies in the paranormal? It could be. It could be. Um, There's so many things going on, not only with consciousness, but AI and... Uh, uh, some of the experiments, uh, what, uh, what I just read the other day, where they can take the brain out of a pig and the brain lives. I mean, if they can take it out of a pig, why couldn't they take it out of a human? So there, there's just so many things going on in that realm of uh, AI, uh, computers, um, consciousness. It's just, it's bizarre is what it is. And... Um, and another thing that's kind of bad about it is you get very little information. You know, there might be uh, an article uh, today, and then you might not see another article for three or four months on, on something. Um, but one thing I will say is there are a lot of people that are challenging AI and consciousness, a lot. And they want more information. They want to know how it's obtainable, how this can be done, what can be done, what what does it mean for the future, for the future generations. It just goes on and on and on. But 
They said the same thing about radios. They said the same thing about televisions, and they said the same thing about radar. Yeah, I find it very intriguing nonetheless, Butch, because I think if I was a police officer, I would have that dilemma in trying to figure out whether or not I would actually write a report on this. I think if you had more than one guy, like if two or three guys saw it and they all made the same report, I don't think there'd be much said. It'd probably get shelved. It wouldn't go anywhere. But, um, you know, one guy, small department, not a chance. Anything new on the Todd C's case? Uh, just some information that we're following up on from a couple witnesses that were there that day. <clears throat> I mean, the day was found. Uh, the one was a real pistol to get a hold of uh, in another state, retired. So we finally got that information. Now we got to put him into the timeline and what he said into the timeline and see if it works out. If it works into the timeline, then that's good. If it doesn't work into the timeline, then it's not good because the timeline with that whole case is very fixed, very, very well documented and very fixed and not documented by us, but documented by official reports and radio reports and incident reports. I mean, the times and places and dates, and that, I mean, everything's there. So if this information fits into that timeline, then it'll be, it'll be good information. Do but you it see, continues. Do you see that case ever being solved? Um, I think we're very close. There's just a couple things that we've got to tie together, and it just seems like the one is not so bad. The other one is really a pistol because, first of all, we can't find the individual we're looking for. He, like, fell off the planet. I'm sure he's out there, but and he was a key part of this. Uh, we just cannot locate him. And then there is a... Um, a problem with one of the doctors at the autopsy whose background is um, questionable as to his allegiance to who he was working for at the time. With a case like that, I mean, it sounds so David Politis type case. Yeah, yeah, it does. In your but, retrospect, and, and David never gives an answer to what he thinks the possibility could be, and I'm not saying that's a flaw. That's just the way he does it to try and sell some books, and good on him for that. That's his career. But when you look at this, and I'm going to ask you to guesstimate here, what do you think happened in that case? Well, it, it you know, in the very beginning, I guess we leaned a little bit toward a murder. But... That made no sense whatsoever because in that area, and I don't care what time of day it was, somebody firing off a gun in the woods would have even got anybody to blink their eyes because it's like the rattlesnake capital of the world. And bear, when, when two of our investigators were up there, uh, they ran into two black bear. So, um, and it's so remote that, you know, all this stuff had gone through with the cocaine and all that stuff would have been crazy because you could have just walked up and hit him in the head with a rock and walked away. You could have walked up and shot him in the head and walked away. Nobody would have cared. So we kind of ruled that out. But, you know, we thought about, well, that's still on the table, the abduction scenario, only because of the condition of the body and how it was found and why it wasn't found and, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. But um, could foul play be involved? In other words, could he have been poisoned? Uh, yeah, that's possible. But who? Who would have done that? Um, we get no help from the police up there. I mean, they just they shut us off a long time ago. Um, so everything we get, we got to claw for and scratch for. But... It's almost like the last three individuals that contacted us have had, like, second thoughts, like, maybe I should say something about what happened or what I saw, which has helped us a great deal. And then um, what was even better was uh, the one that 
uh, gave us information on something that also took place the night of the disappearance, and um, it was a multi-witness uh, event that um, he not only checked out when we checked him out, but he has everything in writing. So it wasn't like just you know him talking to me on the phone. He put it in writing. <clears throat> and then, like I said, the one individual we just can't even locate, and it, it, I can't understand why not, but he just, like I said, fell off the planet. I don't know where he's at. Um, we keep looking. We'll find him eventually. We find everything eventually. I know that, but just, do you think it was foul play? Do you think it was aliens? What do you think it was? Butch, come on, tease me a little bit here. I'm putting oh, you on the spot. Foul. No, no, it was definitely foul play. There was foul play there, Absolutely. But we don't know by whom or what. That's the problem. We can't say it was like his neighbor got pissed off at him one night, went out there and just injected him full of cocaine. Man has no background in drugs whatsoever. The only time this guy was arrested was for a traffic ticket. So uh, you have uh, the condition of the body, which is absolutely abhor abhorrent, and you have um, uh, some... We couldn't find anybody that didn't like this guy. I mean, this guy was, like, very popular, uh, family well-known. Uh, it, it makes no sense. Even when, the, when they were looking for the body, the body was right there. Now, might not have been there the day they were looking, but it was sure there the next day. So how did it get there? Where did it come from? Or did somebody put it there? Or did somebody drop it out of the sky and put it there? We don't know. Were there any other fingerprints or anything on the body during an autopsy? Any marks no. of it being moved? Like no bruising, scabbing? Oh no, no, there was there were the body was covered with bruises. I mean, that area, that terrain is nothing but boulders, small rocks. I mean, there's very few places where it's just plain dirt. Um, I walked up there and I had uh, boots on and those rocks were hurting my feet just walking over them. But it's here's my thought it's either going to be something so stupid that we've overlooked it all these years or it's just going to be something that comes out of the blue and just slaps us right in the face and said here it is and it's going to be irreputable one way or the other you've been up but, there you've been up there Bush. oh yeah a Number lot of pe a lot of people who go into areas like that, and they don't even have to be spiritual, but they pick up on the energy of the place, where it yeah. feels uncomfortable, it feels scary, it feels different, it feels odd, it feels normal, whatever it could be. I think we've all had that feeling. So when you were up there, what's the energy feel like in that area? It's a very close knit small town. Everybody knows everybody else. Um, when we go up there, it's almost like we're pre-announced. Uh, nobody will talk to us. Uh, we've gone up with our, you know, our, our trucks, which are marked, and then we've gone up in vehicles that aren't marked, and they still know who we are. <clears throat> um, there are some people that did talk to us, and you know, they were the ones that said, like, hey, he was a great guy, you know, and all this and the other thing. And then there are people that, you know, it's almost like somebody sent them a telegram and said, we'll be there tomorrow between 10 and 11. They'll, they're going to be driving a black Ford Edge, you know, or whatever. And uh, it's uh, back in the day, uh, when I say that, I'm talking about the 50s and 60s and 70s. That was pretty much a mob-controlled area for drugs and booze. Uh, after that era ended, uh, there's very, um, uh, there's not a lot of work up there. Um, um, there's one restaurant, there's a car dealer, um, a bakery. That's pretty much it. There's not much there at all. It's not a very big town. And it's, um, it, it's, it's very hard to, um, put a tag on that town because there are so many towns like that in Pennsylvania that are just small towns that don't have a lot of population and um, you know everybody that's running the government in that town lives in the town has grown up in the town and everybody knows them I mean it's um, like uh, his brother is uh, a council member 
um, the chief of police had lied his ass off to us. He is uh, he's now head of something up there, um, emergency management or something like that. So it's very hard to get information from them. Uh, we've had some psychics working in that area. Uh, they came up with some stuff that some was helpful, some wasn't. But we can't turn anything down. Um, we did one. Well, the biggest thing we found out was after all, like, like two and a half years or three years of work, we found out that the police department we were dealing with had nothing to do with that case. It was handled by the state police. So they were lying all that time, you know. And then you have a coroner who lied to us on paper. Everything we have is on paper. There's nothing word of mouth. Um, when we went up the last time and tried to contact the fire department because we wanted to see the incident reports for the day of, the, the day before, the day of, and the day after, they hung up on us. That was their emergency line, by the way. So we called them back, and then there was no answer at all. We were to meet with the police officers at their department. Uh, we got there around noon. Uh, they said they were, the lady said they were out to lunch, but they'd be back by 1. Uh, at 5 o'clock, uh, she announced that... Uh, they couldn't get back. They were busy, and they went home. They were done for the day. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah, it is. My friend, we're going to go to the thought of the day right now. Thought of the day happens every night at this time, where during the day we ask you a question. It goes on to our Facebook feed, heads on over to Twitter, and we read your responses on the air. Butch is going to go through those with us tonight. Today's Thought of the Day, what are your thoughts that Dogman is the most dangerous cryptid known to us right now? Butch, I'm going to hit you up first and foremost here. Do you think there is any other cryptid out there that is more dangerous than the dog man? If this is as it's described, I would say, yeah, it is. Because every report, like I said before, it shows no fear, nothing. Even when it's faced off with guys with high-powered weapons, there is no fear. It doesn't back up. So, and if it does have that telepathic ability to tell you that if you pull that trigger, I'm going to rip you apart or it's going to get really bad around here really quick, I would say that would be a very, very dangerous creature to be involved with. Is there any second one? Because we all look at it and think, okay, the two big ones are Bigfoot being number one, Dogman being number two. But I look at sea monsters, man. Those scare me. Maybe it's because I'm not a very, very strong swimmer. I can handle my own, but I could never rescue anybody. Or do you think it's maybe, you know, you head over to Africa where they say there's areas in the jungle where there's still raptors running around or the Mokili Momembe. Oh, I know I said that wrong, but there's there's a uh, lot was, of d different creatures out actually, there. Actually, you said that perfectly right. But anyway, um, I when it comes to the sea, especially, you know, we've only explored 10% of the oceans of this planet. 10%. This planet is, what, 70% water? And we've only done 10%. Um there was an article not too awful long ago about uh, a guy talking about giant sharks and, and, and squid that are unbelievable. They're down deep. I mean, they're not something that's, you know, it's going to be caught in a fishing line. But, uh, you know, could there be a giant shark down there? Absolutely. Why not? Nobody's down, down there looking for it. Um, you have um, um, the Amazon, where new species, deadly species, are pretty much found on a weekly basis now. Um, I just read an article about a, a, a frog that is pretty much an inch and a half in diameter, and that sucker could drop an elephant with one bite. So, I mean, there's so many things out there that we don't know, and it, it you know, kind of, it, it frustrates me somehow, sometimes, but not all the time, because when you start thinking about the mass that you're talking about, like um, the oceans, 
I mean, could there be a, a, a great white out there? Um, well, they've been seen at, you know, 25 feet. Could there be one bigger? Could there be a 50-foot great white? Or, uh, you know, uh, another creature that's unknown, a uh, giant squid. Um, I mean, sea monsters go back in time uh, for when seagoing guys went out there and actually wrote about it. I mean, almost every explorer that uh, from day one had some kind of encounter with something. What it is or what it was, they have no idea. But could it be? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We have no, we have really have no idea what's out there yet. I and there's you. parts of it. And there's even parts of the planet that are ground, it's not water, that we haven't even stepped foot on. That is true. Hell, there's parts of Montana. We went out hunting in Montana and uh, in the Selway Wilderness area. And the guy, the guide said to us, he said, we don't go that way because no white man has ever gone that way, so we don't know what's down there, so we don't go there. So how long has that been? <laughs> I have no idea. But you know what? Next month when you were on, which will be on May 28th, I'm going to ask you about Megalodon. Because I, I tell you, man, that is the hardest guest for me to find. I don't know why. It's the hardest guest for me to find. Somebody who still thinks that Megalodon is a lie. But we'll get to that on a different show. Let's read some of your responses with Butch here today. Sleepy Dave says, I've listened to Vic Cundiff's Dogman encounters from the eyewitness reports. I know Dogman is something I wouldn't want to meet in the woods. Tim states, from Butch's description, sounds like they don't back down and try to intimidate. Catherine, from what I've been hearing, Dogman and the Loop Guru are the same, in my opinion. Yes, Dogman is the most dangerous at the moment. They don't even seem to back down, and I haven't heard of any good encounters with them. Has anybody that you know had a positive encounter with these creatures? Uh, no. No, absolutely not. No. No. Doesn't I mean, even when, even when they didn't have direct contact, and I'm going to use one of the reports, of four ladies going to a park area, uh, on a state park, <coughs> excuse me, going to a state park, they're driving in their car, they're going to park their car in a parking lot at the end of this, tra uh, end of this road, and there's a uh, walking trail, and it's, it, it's a kind of a walking trail, biking trail type deal, and it just kind of makes a couple big loops and brings you back to the parking lot. So these ladies go there and walk they, you know they do the thing and they're all middle-aged or nobody young nobody old and as they're driving down the road the lady hits the brakes and looks to her left and she sees a bipedal standing in the edge of the tree line and it ain't taking her eyes off them we have that in every report that this thing will follow you till you leave it never takes its eyes off you and so she backed up to get a better view and it backed into the woods, just backed up a little bit where it was kind of not seen. And then as she moved forward to make a turnaround in the parking lot, it came out of the woods about two foot past the tree line. And it just watched them till they left. And they don't go back there anymore. Matter of fact, everybody that we had an encounter with doesn't go back there anymore. And that's a good place for us to end this. We're going to end it on two more comments from our audience. Carla says, Out of all the cryptid stories I have heard, Dogman frightens me the most. If they exist, I never want to encounter one. And then there's Gale, urban legend. We don't even have a blurry photo of this one. Touche, Gale. Touche. Butch, give a rundown quickly in about 30 seconds where everybody can find your information. Uh, they can find us at U4COP, U-F-O-R-C-O-P dot com. That's our website. They can find us on Twitter. They can find us on Facebook under UFO Research Center Pennsylvania or my name, Butch Wachowski, or JAR Magazine, which is the Journal of Abduction Research. Um, or uh, they can go on the website and they can go to the contact page and they can email me. And if they, uh, if they want me to call them or talk to them, just tell them to leave the number. Butch, we will see you on May 28th, my friend. You hold on. I'm going to wrap this thing up. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is Watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. 
get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Tomorrow night on the program, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. We have Geraldine Orozco coming in for The Spiritual You. We'll get into all things Zen, Chi, self-healing, and so much more. If you haven't heard Geraldine speak, you are in for a real treat. I want to say a big thank you to everybody listening at home, in your cars, at work, wherever you may be. A special thank you to everybody participating on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio, on Periscope, in the chat room there. Thank you so much. Spreaker, you guys were amazing. Over a thousand comments again tonight. And of course, the Veterans Club on Facebook, the SOR Space Travelers. Thanks for a great night. Thanks for sharing this show. Thanks for making us better. Thanks for pushing us to be the show that you want because together my friends we own the night mr bumblefoot we need a favor we need you to take us home see you in 21 hours good night <laughs>